Julie Candler with the BBC News. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he would have died from COVID-19 if it hadn't been for the care he received at the London Hospital from which he was discharged today. In a message of thanks to the doctors and nurses who treated him, Mr Johnson said it could have gone either way. The number of coronavirus deaths in UK hospitals has now risen above 10,000. Mr Johnson, who spent three days in intensive care after his admission last Sunday, said he owed a huge debt to the National Health Service. We will win because our NHS is the beating heart of this country. It is the best of this country. It is unconquerable. It is powered by love. A leading scientist advising the British government on the pandemic has warned that it's not yet known whether people who test positive for the virus become permanently immune. Speaking to the BBC, Jeremy Farrar of the Wellcome Trust highlighted how in South Korea dozens of people had tested positive for the illness a second time. I think there's been almost 100 reports now of people that have been infected, they seem to have recovered, and then at a later date they became infected again. It is critical to understand whether those are one viral infection that has persisted in one individual for a considerable time and now has reactivated, or whether they've been infected with a second virus. Italy has recorded its lowest daily number of coronavirus deaths in more than three weeks, 431. Officials say the crisis there has peaked. Italy has suffered more fatalities than any other European nation and seems certain to join the United States above the 20,000 mark tomorrow. Spain registered another 619 deaths, bucking a previous downward trend. From Madrid, his guy Hedgeco. There are some statistical reasons that might be somehow distorting these figures at the moment, and that's possible because of the Easter holiday and it might be delaying how local authorities are reporting their figures. So I think there's always been a suspicion that the figures over this Easter holiday might not be entirely reliable. New York has seen its lowest daily increase in the number of hospital patients since the authorities started tracking the data nearly four weeks ago. Andrew Cuomo, the state's governor, called it good news, but he said for a sixth consecutive day more than 700 people had died. The top infectious disease doctor in the US has said that reopening the country will need to be a very gradual process and restrictions could only be lifted soon in certain areas. Dr Anthony Fauci said that inevitably there will be further infections as restrictions are loosened. But if it's done slowly, there'll be time to identify cases and isolate them. World News from the BBC. A French aircraft carrier on which 50 sailors have tested positive for COVID-19 has arrived in the port of Toulon in the south of France. Three crew members had already been flown to a military hospital there as a precaution. The crews of both the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier and the frigate accompanying it will be tested and placed under quarantine for two weeks. Pope Francis has delivered his Easter address from behind closed doors at a deserted St Peter's Basilica, calling for global solidarity in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. He said everyone was suffering and governments needed to act together to deal with the economic fallout. Our religion editor Martin Bashir has this report. In Rome, Pope Francis delivered his annual message in starkly different circumstances to those normally associated with the joy of Easter Sunday. No flowers around the basilica, no pilgrims in St Peter's Square. And he referred to the rebuilding of Europe after the Second World War as a way to honour the faith and fight back against the coronavirus. Air France has been forced to postpone a flight from the Republic of Congo after a security official shot and damaged the plane. The incident happened at the airport in Pointe-Noire, the country's second largest city. No passengers were on board the plane when it was shot at. It was supposed to be repatriating French citizens because of the coronavirus outbreak. In other news, the Taliban say they've released 20 prisoners they describe as members of the Afghan government. The militants have published photographs of the men, who they say are Afghan soldiers, detained in Kandahar several years ago. There's been no confirmation of the release from the Afghan authorities, nor has Kabul identified the men. BBC News.
This is from our own correspondent on the BBC World Service. I'm Pascal Harter. Hello and welcome to the programme. This month it's Passover, Easter and Ramadan. But in the holy city of Jerusalem, Jews, Christians and Muslims can't observe their traditions with friends and family this year. We speak to the leaders of all three faiths about how they're looking after their communities. In Hungary, we ask, is democracy a casualty of the coronavirus quarantine? And in Haiti, we visit a voodoo ceremony. But first, the US state of Louisiana has known plenty of bad times. Hurricane Katrina swept people's homes away in 2005 and caused billions of dollars of damage. But in spite of the adversity its residents have faced, locals still like to let the good times roll. And this is why so many tourists like to visit too. Mardi Gras, with its parades and parties, is the culmination of a month of celebrations in New Orleans. But early in March, Louisiana recorded its first case of the coronavirus. It's now what's known as a coronavirus hot zone. The bars are closed, the clubs are silent. Harry Shearer, acclaimed radio host and a well-known voice from the cartoon show The Simpsons, is afraid for the future of his city. Although he also recognises that it has been here before. Carnival in New Orleans begins in earnest with two parades on a Saturday night. This year, I was the king of one of them, wearing a regally embroidered bathrobe on a carriage that, unlike the one I rode as the parade's first king a decade ago, actually completed the entire route. It was early February, mild weather. The streets were full of people celebrating their first real chance this year to celebrate. A month later, the city's mayor declared a state of emergency. The novel coronavirus had come to town. The laissez le bon temps roulé culture of New Orleans is built on three centuries of disasters, big and small. A recent article by the prestigious cultural geographer Richard Campanella reminds us of the recurrent outbreaks of yellow fever and, yes, malaria that challenged the city through its first 200 years. The last yellow fever outbreak in the Crescent City, so named for its geographical embrace of the meandering Mississippi, occurred only a little more than a hundred years ago. So, New Orleans celebrates every day, every moment, in the shadow of the knowledge that our good fortune is quite temporary. The flip side of that knowledge is a desire and an ability to rebuild after each challenge. After the 2005 flood, that rebuilding was an arduous battle against widespread predictions of the city's impending demise. Those maledictions included a comment from the then Speaker of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., Dennis Hastert, that the city should be given up as a lost cause. Well, the city is still here. There are echoes of this history, as New Orleans has been branded one of the pandemic's hotspots. The city's culture is based in the streets. Funerals, parades, semi-spontaneous parties, brass bands. It is a culture of gatherings and minglings of which Mardi Gras is only the biggest, the one we share with outsiders. A lockdown, or a shelter-in-place order, as we call it in the United States, is particularly painful in a place where solitude belongs only to the writers, the visual artists, and the less fortunate elderly. New Orleans has a hurricane season, June through November. Not to jinx anything, but contrary to the dire predictions Katrina spawned, most of America's hurricanes have been heading up the country's east, not its Gulf Coast. Given those facts, New Orleanians often hold hurricane parties as the storms near. Now friends have been telling me of the kids, the damn kids, holding COVID parties in the neighborhood. Last week, the deadly virus took a local jazz patriarch Ellis Marsalis, the paterfamilias of the Marsalis clan. Not only was he a pillar of the city's storied tradition of piano players, not only was he the father of Wynton Marsalis, who's gone on to lead jazz at New York's Lincoln Center, but Ellis was revered for decades as one of the city's prime educators of young musical talent. This has been a particularly difficult few years for the music community, which bade farewell to R&B giants like Alan Toussaint, singer-pianist Dr. John, and less world-famous but equally potent pianist Henry Butler. 
It's been decades since New Orleans music had a prominent place in America's pop framework, back to 60s hits like Working in a Coal Mine and Mother-in-Law, but music remains one of the city's major lures for tourists. Along with cups of rum drinks, you can take into the streets with you. We call them Go Cups. The city's leaders are wondering about the community's future as a tourist magnet, much as they did post-Katrina. Perhaps perplexingly, while a state governor says local hospitals need more ventilators, the governing board of the convention center, itself now a makeshift hospital, is preparing to vote on a billion-dollar plan for a new hotel and entertainment district. And in another echo of the post-Katrina moment, there has been a certain amount of victim-blaming. Some observers from outside are saying the city became a virus hotspot because of the authorities' failure to cancel Mardi Gras. In fact, Fat Tuesday occurred three weeks before President Trump declared a national emergency. The city cherishes its otherness, its cultural difference from the rest of the country, and the city pays for it. We worry about the future of that culture. Can the music venues survive? Can the restaurants? Many of the eateries have set up takeaway services trying to stay open, keep their staffs employed. But only my best-off friends are able to keep ordering. Others wonder about the safety of eating food prepared by other people's hands. The quiet is reminiscent, too. Fifteen years ago, there was no traffic. There were no children, no dogs. In some neighborhoods, neighbors on adjoining front porches are collaborating in spontaneous jazz performances. But, for the most part, the music of New Orleans now, as in 2006, is mainly the melodic whistles of the freight trains that still roll through, and the whistles of the freighters still plying the Mississippi. Harry Shearer. It's Easter this weekend. It's also the Jewish holiday of Passover, and the Islamic holy month of Ramadan will soon get underway. In Jerusalem, a city holy to all three faiths, these holidays would usually be observed and celebrated by a coming together of friends and family. But this year, of course, is very different. Jerusalem is in lockdown. Working from her home, our Middle East correspondent Yolan Nell has been asking local religious leaders how they will be observing the holidays. Usually at this time, there's a crush of foreign visitors and locals heading through the gates in the ancient, crenellated walls of Jerusalem's old city. But now they stand eerily quiet. And in recent days, workers wearing masks and those now familiar white hazmat suits have been spraying disinfectant around the holy places, on the revered stones of the Western Wall and wooden doors leading to Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Holy Sepulchre Church. At Easter, we like to go almost every day to Jerusalem to participate in the celebrations, laments Father Jamal Khada, a Catholic priest in Ramallah. This year, we miss that a lot. He's speaking to me on Skype inside his own empty parish church in the West Bank. On Palm Sunday, there was no magnificent spectacle of thousands of Christians marching from the Mount of Olives carrying their palm fronds. With a ban on mass gatherings, Easter services inside the Holy Sepulchre built where many believe Jesus was crucified, entombed and resurrected, are taking place in front of cameras only. Families are encouraged to watch at home on TV or online and simply pray together. This year will be unique, but we have to do it for the safety of everyone and to live the spirit of Easter, says Father Jamal. During these strange circumstances, which have me interviewing religious leaders in my slippers at home on my laptop, I ask Father Jamal how he comforts his worried parishioners. With a smile, he replies that the Easter message has a special resonance right now. The resurrection of Christ is the basis of our faith and at the same time our hope in a better future, he tells me. It's a message of hope that the darkness will not last. Unable to film Rabbi Yehoshua Pfeffer in person in Jerusalem, the oldest of his eight children step in to help with a smartphone – and they take shots of each other, cleaning to get rid of the chametz, traces of leavened food prohibited during Passover. I hate this, says one girl, grimacing as she checks down the back of the sofa. On the night of the traditional Seder meal, Israel's government banned travel between cities and told people in Jewish-majority areas not to leave their homes. The fear was that customary celebrations with relatives and friends could spread COVID-19. It's really tough, says Rabbi Pfeffer, who missed his parents. 
but among the foremost obligations of Torah law is to keep others safe. As he sees it, this Passover each household ate alone, much as the scriptures say Jewish families did before their exodus from slavery in Egypt, the event marked by the holiday. And Rabbi Pfeffer believes confinement encourages self-reflection. It's an opportunity to deepen our faith, he suggests, to deepen our relationships with those around us. When I link up with Dr. Mustafa Abu Sway, an Islamic scholar, his wife becomes my camerawoman. With a few tips, she films our setup shot and close-ups. I'm finding remotely interviewing people in this way leads to a surprising intimacy. Dr. Mustafa's favourite Ramadan memories involve his family, the smell after his father put orange peel on the stove when he was a boy as they ate before starting the dawn-to-dusk fast, and praying at Al-Aqsa Mosque with his parents and children. Tight restrictions to stop infection, which have seen the famous mosque closed like other places of worship, are expected to stay in place during the coming holy month. We'll miss the large get-togethers, Dr Mustafa remarks, but it's going to be back to basics, and it might also be a reminder for all of us that what we take for granted is not always going to be there. In the contested holy city of Jerusalem, religion often divides rather than unites. So when I ask these faith leaders about their messages for the holidays, I'm struck by their replies. I can see there's a certain willingness to put conflict on hold and collaborate during these difficult times, and I'd say, why not, says Dr Mustafa, why not basically change our worldviews? These days showed us clearly that we're one big human family, comments Father Jamal. It's time to realise we're in the same boat, observes Rabbi Pfeffer how much our similarities outweigh and overshadow our differences, and to come together in faith, prayer and dependence on God. During this frightening pandemic, there's solace in such expressions of goodwill, and many here will hope for lasting change when the crowds return once more to Jerusalem's sacred sites. That was Yoland Nell. I'm Pascal Harter, and this is From Our Own Correspondent on the BBC World Service. Several governments have given themselves far-reaching executive powers in the name of curbing the spread of the coronavirus, but Hungary has gone further than most. While Germany introduced testing, Singapore tightened surveillance and forced quarantine orders, Hungary's parliament has given the Prime Minister Viktor Orban the power to rule by decree indefinitely. The question is, why did parliament go for it? because it is dominated by Mr Orban's own party, says Nick Thorpe in Budapest, and opposition parties had to choose between this or being portrayed as enemies of the nation. This is a chicken game, Zoltan Kiseli explained as we strolled through a quiet city park near his home in Budapest's 9th district, just before the lockdown came into effect. The air hummed with the first birds and the last children of spring. Soon the children were hustled indoors by anxious parents. Sultan teaches political science at a Budapest university and is a devout supporter of the government, so he knows a lot about the chicken game. In its simplest form, two drivers steer directly at each other, and the first to lose his nerve and swerve is a chicken, a coward. All opposition parties in Hungary supported the idea of extending the state of emergency, which the government declared on March the 11th when Hungary still had very few infections. But by making the law valid ad infinitum, whenever the Prime Minister decides the emergency is over, and by introducing a punitive clause allowing for journalists to be jailed for publishing misleading or false information about the emergency, the government left the opposition little choice but to oppose it. Accusations of courage and cowardice flew to and fro in Parliament as well. Viktor Orban doesn't usually lose his temper, but he came very close when he bellowed across the floor at the opposition benches that his 133 brave deputies alone stood for the national interest. Then I watched him almost spitting fire as Peter Jokob, leader of the opposition Jobbik party, steered his own patriotic bus straight at him. The real cowards, Mr Jokob told him, are those who use the emergency to seize unlimited power while the doctors and nurses of this country are fighting a life-and-death battle with the virus. While the politicians exchanged unfriendly fire, 
I visited the University Hospital in Debrecen in eastern Hungary to see the preparations for the coronavirus patients. The current patients have been emptied from the infectious diseases ward and the workmen have moved in, laying pipes and installing new doors, monitors and beds. The trick, Dr. Istvan Varkonyi told me, is to create negative air pressure in each ward. So when a doctor or nurse comes in to visit a patient with the virus, the air from the corridor sweeps into the room and out through the window. What has happened in traditional hospitals where patients have been taken is that when the door opens, the infection spreads from the ward, straight out into the corridors and through the ventilation system, infecting other patients and medical staff. At one poorly equipped and ill-prepared hospital at Suceva in northeast Romania, no less than 182 doctors and nurses caught the virus and 30 patients died. On the streets of Hungary, people have shown more common sense, kindness to strangers and solidarity than many thought they were capable of. In the village where I write these lines, people who haven't spoken to each other in years discuss the state of the world, at a safe distance, of course. Though there are exceptions. My Chinese friend Tsangi was filming a cooking programme in the main covered market in Budapest in early March, when no less than four separate butchers, you know, the ones with shaved heads, he told me, swore and cursed his crew all the way back to China. Prime Minister Viktor Orban, like Donald Trump in America, devoted many of his early comments to finding ways to link coronavirus to illegal migration. Iranian students in Hungary were indeed among the early transmitters, but far from being here illegally, they were actually on a generous medical scholarship created by the Orban government. It has since turned out that some of the first cases of infection were Hungarians skiing in northern Italy and Austria, including the rector of the university hospital in Seged, who went straight back to work, ignoring the recommended quarantine. Independent journalists in Hungary remain, so far at least, undaunted by either the threat of prosecution or the hate campaign against them in some pro-government papers. We're not panicking, András Földes told me in the empty offices of Index, the top online news portal. His colleagues had not gone underground, they were working happily from home. We try to work as if we were in an independent and free country. This is our only choice, András explained. Nick Thorpe. Lastly, to an Easter festival with a difference. Souvenance is a week-long gathering that takes place each year on a dusty plain outside the city of Gonaïve in Haiti. It's one of the holiest pilgrimage for believers of voodoo. After Haiti declared independence from France in 1804, the voodoo faith flourished and became a symbol of liberty for the nation. It remains the dominant religion there. Thomas Rees remembers well attending the festival. 6am and the sun was coming up. The light scattered softly through the branches of the mapu trees, warm on our faces and our aching limbs. I was half asleep. We all were. The worshippers in their crisp white dresses and headscarves sat on the sprawling roots. The conch shell sounded, then the murmur of the shaker and the pad of bare feet on bare earth. Numinous light, a hundred voices singing in unison. In my time travelling in Haiti, I attended many voodoo ceremonies, but none were quite like souvenance. This voodoo community, or Laku, is one of the largest and most important in Haiti. Each year, voodoo initiates known as Hunsis and hundreds of visitors travel from across the country and beyond to take part in rituals dedicated to the Daume spirits. Each morning, we woke at dawn for prayers, and in the afternoons we gathered in an earth-floored temple decorated with a glittering chandelier and red and blue ribbons. A team of drummers hammered out galloping rhythms, passing round bottles of rum and planting cigarettes between each other's lips as the Hoonsies danced and sang late into the night. When they all changed into their brightly coloured costumes, floral dresses and paisley shirts, patterned head wraps and sashes embroidered with gold, the temple looked like one rippling swathe of fabric, a human magic eye. Real voodoo bears little resemblance to the twisted stereotype conjured up by Haiti's colonisers, missionaries and Hollywood film directors. People do get possessed. You see the Hunsi's eyes roll back until their pupils vanish. They stagger and flail and shriek and giggle uncontrollably. They fall at the feet of the serviteur, the spiritual leader of the Lakou, 
and leap into a sacred pool. There are sacrifices too. Goats with deep neck wounds are carried into the temple on dancers' shoulders, staining their white headscarves crimson. A bull is dispatched as a gift to Ogu Ferai, the warrior spirit, who helped the Haitian slaves defeat the armies of Napoleon and win their freedom at the turn of the 19th century. And guinea fowl are offered to the spirits of the Mapu trees, their downy blue-grey feathers scattered along with libations of sparkling wine and crumbs of white cake. Only there's nothing dark, nothing frightening about any of it. It feels like giving thanks. The respect for the animals is profound and nothing is wasted. After each ceremony, the offerings are skinned and butchered by wiry men with practised hands and ferried off to the kitchens. Fascinated young boys gather round to help and prod the still warm intestines just to watch them jiggle, to feel life slip away through their fingers. What struck me most was the depth of the devotion, the endurance, the sheer effort the Hunsis go to to do right by their gods and by their ancestors. Souvenance has been held since the early days of Haitian independence, but the rituals themselves have West African origins that go back hundreds of years before that. You feel part of something truly ancient, just as your sense of time begins to unravel. The days pass in a blur of candlelit processions and songs dedicated to the spirit Legba, who opens the door to the spirit world. The Hunsis dance through rainstorms and churn the Mapu grove to mud. The ceremonial Asoto drums come out, each as tall as a person. One night, I woke to the shrieks of processions and drumming so loud and visceral it sounded like it was coming from just outside my tent. I woke again an hour later, and the Lakou was quiet, washed with pale moonlight. Sleeping figures lay in doorways, sprawled on mats of woven palm leaves and tangled in the back of pickup trucks. A souvenir hat seller dozed on a pile of souvenir hats. At dawn the next morning, I asked my friend Mano if he was tired. There is no tired, he replied. We have to work. We're here to serve the spirits. Souvenance isn't just about worship, though. It's also about community. The concept of sharing what you have, of eating and drinking together, often from the same plate of rice and beans or the same bottle of rum, is strong in voodoo. Both worshippers and visitors are considered children of the Laku, part of an extended family. Each year, old friends return from Paris, Miami and Montreal, and new ones are made. When it's all over, what stays with you is a feeling of warmth, the feeling of early morning sunlight on your face, and of belonging to something bigger. Thomas Rees. That's all for this edition, but there will be more in our next programme, so do join us again next weekend for more from our own correspondent. This is the BBC World Service. What would it be like if dinosaurs still roamed the Earth? We probably still would have gotten wiped out eventually. Or we'd be pets. We have good grasping abilities. I bet, you know, we could be useful. What does space sound like? So that is the sound of a gravitational wave signal coming from a black hole. Will planting trees stop global warming? We could capture about two-thirds of the full emissions of carbon that we've done today. And that is only in the above-ground biomass. That's the parts of the tree that are above the soil. What would it be like to ride a beam of light? From the point of view of a photon, which is a particle of light, the entire universe is perfectly still. Understanding the world and looking to the future. Science on the BBC World Service. On this week's Cultural Frontline, we meet the artist who's dedicated himself to the exploration of sound. Nick Ryan tells us why he wants us all to share what we hear. It's dramatic how much lower the overall level of sound pollution there is. And what it's left behind are things which ordinarily are there, but they've been unmasked. More from sound artist Nick Ryan on the cultural front line after the latest BBC News. BBC News with Julie Candler. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he would have died from COVID-19 if it hadn't been for the care he received at the London Hospital from which he was discharged today. In a message of thanks to the doctors and nurses who'd treated him, Mr Johnson said it could have gone either way. 
The number of coronavirus deaths in UK hospitals has now risen above 10,000. A leading scientist advising the British government on the pandemic has said the country could emerge as the worst affected country in Europe. Jeremy Farrar of the Wellcome Trust said it was inevitable the disease would return in a second and even third wave. Italy has recorded its lowest daily number of coronavirus deaths in more than three weeks, 431. Officials say the crisis there has peaked. New York has seen its lowest daily increase in the number of hospital patients since the authorities started tracking the data nearly four weeks ago. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of the US state worst hit by the coronavirus, called it good news. Sri Lanka has announced new legislation making cremation compulsory for coronavirus victims. The new law extends to anyone suspected of dying of COVID-19. The move has been criticised by Muslim groups. Pope Francis has delivered his Easter address from behind closed doors at St Peter's Basilica, calling for global solidarity in the face of the pandemic. He said governments needed to act together to deal with the economic fallout. One of the world's best-known opera singers, the Italian tenor Andrea Bocelli, is performing a live concert in the empty Duomo Cathedral in Milan, the centre of the Italian region that's been worst hit by the coronavirus. His Music for Hope concert is being streamed worldwide as billions of people remain at home. BBC News. I am Alejandro González Iñárritu and you are listening to The Cultural Frontline on the BBC World Service. I'm Noelle El Magafi and this is the program that explores the world we live in through the work and the voices of artists. Welcome to The Cultural Frontline. Today, stories of artists exploring and experimenting with new technology, all in the search of great art. Coming up, a glimpse into the sinister side of tech with the novelist Samantha Schweblin. It is not about how dangerous technology could be. It is more about a timeless dilemma, about what kind of people we all could become in real life when nobody can see us. And we step into the world of meme culture with the writer Anja Mina. I think memes have this role in, in helping us process our emotions to help us understand what is going on in society in the story of the coronavirus and how it's um, going viral on the internet um, is, is really a full expression of the complexities of meme culture. Those stories and more on this week's Cultural Frontline, so stay with us. When you wake up in the morning or open a window, what do you hear? Perhaps it's the sound of the wind or animals, or maybe it's traffic or the sound of people at work. Our first guest today, Nick Ryan, is an artist who has dedicated himself to the exploration and understanding of sound, and he wants to hear what you hear. Nick is embarking on an ambitious project to collect the sounds heard by people around the world during the coronavirus pandemic. You'll find out more about that a little later. First, I wanted to ask Nick about creating a machine that uses artificial intelligence to translate spoken words into unique sounds. What I've been trying to do is to use machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing to see if we can build a machine which translates a word into a sound. I recently produced a prototype of this machine called the Gulf of Understanding. It enables you to speak into a microphone and then hear the sound of what you've said played back to you uh, as an experience. So if I say splash, I'd hear some water splashing. Exactly. If you said rain, you'd be surrounded in headphones by the sound of rain. Can you tell me exactly how the artificial intelligence behind the project works? What our tool does is um, analyse a huge, what we call, corpus of language. So we feed it with text, in our case, 100 million pages of Google News. From this, we can actually embed words in an n-dimensional space of vectors, and uh, we can establish the, the proximity of different words to each other in relation to their semantic connection and also their syntactical connection. So, for example, we can establish how similar two words like 
man and woman are. That's a semantic uh, proximity. But we could also establish how syntactically they, they are connected to each other as well. The reason for doing this project is to establish in some way whether there are cross-cultural commonalities between the phonetic sounds we make with our mouths and and what they mean. Uh, and I'm very interested to, to kind of explore how much of uh, vocal sound is specific to culture and how much of it is actually common to all humans. Um, shall we try some of this out? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's try the word love. Thirty love. <laughs> so what we have there is um, a demonstration of how impossible it is to translate between the sound of a word and the sound of its meaning. Um, you've got three different potential uh, representations which the machine prototype has, has created. One of them is, is, is it brings up as a tennis match in which the word love is used by the umpire. But then the second has actually been created because that particular sound file uh, has been associated with the word adore. And our AI model tells us that adore is syntactically and semantically uh, very, very close to the word love. It has a score of 0 0.4 out of uh, a scale between minus one and plus one. So it's actually very, very similar to love. And then the last one is actually um, a tango flourish, which is a cultural example of how love can be manifest in music. OK, so let's try um, a city, um, the city of Mumbai. So obviously the word Mumbai, uh, for someone who lives in Mumbai, could be translatable into a, an infinite number of sonifications, sound experiences. In this case, uh, this is a recording of the interior of a bus in Mumbai. Whether or not that is a depiction of the word Mumbai uh, for someone who lives there or not is highly subjective, obviously. I've been to Mumbai and that definitely reminded me of the hustle and bustle of the city. I guess, you know, since the lockdown began, I'm more aware of the sounds that are happening around us. You know, the simple things like waking up in the morning, instead of hearing traffic outside the window, we're able to hear the birds sing or the wind between the trees. How have the sounds we've, we hear changed since the start of the coronavirus lockdown? Well, they've changed very dramatically for, for all of us, haven't they? Um, Murray Schaefer, who coined this phrase, the soundscape, actually describes the sound of the urban environment as having a multiplicity of sonic jabberware, which I think is a really lovely description of this kind of frenetic, roaring, rumbling, banging, hissing, whining, cyclical uh, mechanical human-made sound all around us. And of course, that's generated by largely by transportation and the movement of people, as well as things like construction, roadworks, and so on. Um, and all of that has gone, it seems. It's dramatic how much lower the overall level of noise in the city, sound pollution, there is, uh, particularly if you live in a city, it's much, much quieter. And what it's left behind are things which ordinarily are there, but they've been unmasked. So one of the most profound uh, sounds for me leaning out of my window is the dawn chorus, which is something that in London you very rarely hear. Uh, and yet every morning at 5.30 a.m., when the sun just begins to rise and it reaches the top branches of the trees, the birds at the top of the tree receive the sunlight increase first and they start singing. And then as the sun rays penetrate the tree, more and more birds start singing. Last week, I heard the dawn chorus outside my uh, apartment in London and I could hear duetting blackbirds at opposite ends of the street, at least 300 metres away from each other. As listeners, we can think of sound uh, as being divided into these three categories. The anthrophonic sound, which is sound made by humans, uh, like transport and construction, all the noise pollution, if you like. And then we have these two other categories, biophonic sound, which are sounds made by 
creatures other than us, and then geophonic sound, which is sound made by the landscape and weather, so acoustics or the sound of rain. Uh, and if you start to take the anthrophonic sound out of the equation, the sounds that we make, which tend to be louder than the other two, you can then hear weather, you can hear the movement of leaves in trees, you can hear birdsong. Can you even hear earthquakes? The rumbling on the surface of the planet, which is generated by cities, city transportation, is gone. So seismologists are able to actually detect as low as 5.5 Richter scale earthquakes from opposite sides of the planet from each other. So it's, it's really not just the sounds that um, we can hear, but um, vibrations on a, on a seismological frequency that, that are also more audible too. Wow, that's incredible. And the discovery of all these new sounds has inspired your new project. Um, tell us a bit about that. Well, I'm really interested in how the sound experience of the city um, and the rural landscape has changed all over the world. And what I'm trying to do is make some recordings safely, I should mention, from the confines of my self-isolation in London of things that I have never heard before. How can our listeners contribute to your new project? Well, I would absolutely love to hear from anyone in any part of the world whose sound world has changed dramatically. I'd like them to send me recordings of sounds that they can hear from, very importantly, from where they are without going outside if they're not allowed to go outside. And if it's difficult for them to record those sounds, perhaps they can record themselves telling me about those sounds because that's sometimes just as interesting as the sound itself. What are you going to do with all these sounds? What I would love to do is to create a map of the world which enables anyone to listen to these newfound sounds from anywhere around the world and kind of listen in on different parts of the world in a sort of interactive sound installation. Remember that these are sounds which potentially may never be heard in the same way again. Just to clarify, we need the details of where the sound was recorded, a description of the sound, and of course you can record this on your phone or any device, but the number one rule is please don't break any rules to record these sounds. Just sounds from your windows and your homes will be absolutely great. Right, Nick? Absolutely. Yes, please. That was the sound artist, Nick Ryan. Have you seen the video clips of people finding it impossible not to touch their face? And what's your favourite joke about stockpiled toilet paper? As much of the world is currently in lockdown, we're being inundated by internet memes about the coronavirus crisis. Some of them are funny, some of them are silly, and some of them quite offensive. We asked internet culture expert Anne Jaumina to shed some light on meme culture and the impact memes can have on us all. Hi, my name is Ad Shamina. I'm a researcher of internet culture and phenomena. I recently wrote the book Memes to Movements about uh, memes and politics. And my favorite meme of late is called Introspective Pug. And it's a picture of a forlorn looking pug um, sitting in the back of a car, gazing uh, solemnly out the window as it rains. Uh, one of the, my favorite image macros of this uh, is uh, he's, he's looking out and he says, I don't know, man, I just, what if he really did throw the tennis ball, you know? Meme culture is the use of memes to express different aspects of, of society or politics or, or just your feelings. A meme is a form of media that is remixed and shared amongst the community, especially online, but, but also offline. Memes are, um, have recently become quite popular in discourse and in news and politics, but have been part of our culture for many years now, um, both on the internet and even in pre-internet times. Memes have influenced society and the way we, we talk and think about uh, the things around us. One very popular example of an image macro meme that I think a lot of people are familiar with is Success Kid. It's this little baby um, that is uh, holding up his fist and, and has a little smirk on his face. And he looks like he's, he's happy, like he's, he's just hit success. You have Success Kid and he says, put $5 in pocket, pull out 10 Late to work, boss was even later. See nickel on ground, actually a silver dollar. Um, so these, these image macros, you know, they set up a situation and then on the top of the text and then um, just below um, the, the bottom text puts together a punchline. Um, as you can imagine, these are very remixable, easy to create, easy to share. 
In the wake of the uh, the spread of the coronavirus and the pandemic, memes have this role in, in helping us process our emotions to help us understand what is going on in society in the story of the coronavirus and how it's um, going viral on the internet um, is, is really a full expression of the complexities of meme culture. You have examples of, of misinformation memes um, just recently, both on text messages and on uh, public social media. The intent, or the effect at least, of exacerbating confusion and panic um, during, during a stressful time. On the flip side is that people are using memes to share information or helpful information um, in a funny way. And so um, there have been flatten the curve memes that are used to, to help people understand that this kind of public health phenomenon where social distancing can actually help flatten the curve, uh, so to speak, of, uh, of coronavirus cases. And so hashtag flatten the curve became a meme. The one variant was using the distracted boyfriend meme when the boyfriend is being distracted by the, the possibilities of flattening the curve rather than hanging out with his friends. The writer and internet culture expert, Anjao Mina. I'm Noel al Magafi, and this is The Cultural Frontline on the BBC World Service. It's been estimated that there are now more mobile devices, that's mobile phones, smartphones and tablets, than there are people in the world. At a time when we're relying on those devices more and more, a new novel from Argentinian author Samantha Schweblin offers a gripping insight into a very sinister side of technology. Written in short chapters, we glimpse different people across the globe, from Mexico to Croatia. They're all connected by small, toy-like devices made to look like cute animals called Kentuckys. Each Kentucky has a camera behind its eyes and can move around, though not actually speak. And each device is being controlled by another person somewhere else in the world. From the first few pages, Samantha poses the question, are those owning and operating the Kentucky more sinister than the technology itself? I spoke to Samantha about what inspired her to tell this story. There was a mix of fears and curiosities. I was traveling a lot that year, touring the, the last novel, Fever Dream. So I was moving from one country to another, continuously contrasting uh, cultures, traditions, languages. But uh, how equally they all were in front of technology idiosyncrasies. I remember I was traveling in a public bus in Buenos Aires, and I was about to have lunch with my father and something about the idea of a drone caught my mind. And I just asked myself how it can be that something as complex as a drone can exist and even could be possible to buy it in a supermarket. But instead, nothing as simple as a Kentucky still doesn't exist. So the idea just popped into my head. And I remember that I told my father right away because I know that was the kind of technological occurrences that he likes. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, we must copyright it right now. Of course, I, I was zero interested in on that field. So I remember he looked at me very disappointed and told me, well, at least write a novel. I think your father was thinking ahead. <laughs> The book features characters from all over the world interacting with Kentuckys, and it swaps between their stories. Why did you choose to tell the story in this way? The story is set in more than 20 different cities. I like to think in the novel like a choral story made with different voices, a panoptic view of how technology could impact in different cultures and nations at the same time. It's interesting how different in ages and traditions we can be as nations, but how equal we act in front of some new technology gadgets and social media. Technology has a right for all at the same time and with the same rules and languages. For example, it's always surprised me when I am in the belly in a subway I live in Berlin. You can travel between an old Chinese lady and a young Turkish woman. Maybe her head is completely covered, except by her eyes. But you can see how both are absolutely plunged into their phones with the same sense of immediacy and taking similar technical decisions. And that was the reason because I needed to tell this story from a lot of different points of view. Has writing the book changed your interaction with technology at all? It made me more aware, maybe, 
sometimes it's hard to completely understand how it has changed me when I am still too close to the book. What I can say is at the beginning of the writing process, I was surprised with the subject, you know, technology <laughs> out of my comfort zone and even of my zone of interest. I have a choral narrator instead of a first-person narrator, a piece of technology device that doesn't exist. I ask myself, what is this craziness about? But at the end, I realized I was working with the same demons, the same feelings, and even the same pace or tone or tension I have been working with all my, my other novels. It's, it's a novel about desire, about fear, about solitude. This is not a book about technology. It's about what we ourselves can become when we connect with the others hidden under technology. It is not about how dangerous technology could be. It is more about a timeless dilemma, about what kind of people we all could become in real life when nobody can see us. So this is an extract from my book. Uh, this is about Alina. It is one of its main characters. She needed to chat, urgently needed to decide for herself what kind of dweller she'd gotten. Then it occurred to her that this crow could peck openly at her private life, would see her whole body, get to know the tone of her voice, her clothes, her schedules. It could move freely about the room and at night it would also see Sven. She, on the other hand, could only ask questions. The Kentucky could decide not to answer, or it could lie. It could say it was a Filipina schoolgirl when it was actually an Iranian oil dealer. But she had to show it her entire life transparently, as available as she had been to the poor canary she would have as a teenager that had died watching her hanging in its cage in the middle of her room. The Kentucky chirped and Alina looked at it, frowning. It was a metallic chirp, like the sound a baby eagle would make inside an empty tin can. So you're currently in Argentina, away from your hometown of Berlin. How have you been affected by the coronavirus? A month ago, I came to Argentina in a short trip for visiting my family. And they live in a very small and isolated town in the south of the south of the country. And I got trapped here because of the quarantine and the curfew. So my flights were cancelled and now I couldn't come back home. So, of course, a lot of things have been cancelled after that. But I have the feeling that even with all these disadvantages, I still can do a lot of things thanks to technology. Exactly. So how has technology played a role in helping you during the crisis? Well, for example, I am I'm writing a second screenplay with the cinema director Claudia Chosa. We already write an adaptation of Fever Dream that will be on Netflix in a couple of months. And now we are writing a second screenplay. We write by Skype like four or five hours a day. And that gives me, even living here in the middle of the woods, <laughs> in the <laughs> south of the south, gives me this idea of normality that really saved me. Author Samantha Schweblin. Her novel Little Eyes will be available later this month. Has a book, a film or a game ever changed the way you see the world? For Charlie Brooker, the mastermind behind the hit TV series Black Mirror, it was a love for video games, including a childhood playing Asteroid, that helped shape his outlook on life. Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and video games changed my life. Apparently. <laughs> I was always into games and yeah. things. I remember from my first encounters with video games were arcade machines and I remember being spellbound by the notion that here was a television, which was a thing I liked, mm -hmm. but you could control it. It literally had a, it had a stick and some buttons attached to it. And when you moved the stick and pressed the buttons, things happened on the, on the magic telly. The first games I encountered were in public in monolithic mm. cabinets before I saw any, anything like that on a TV. Where the arcade machines that I was seeing, they were at a swimming pool in the sort of leisure area. Like there was a sort of post-swim, I guess it was a bar, but I wasn't... 
I wasn't aware of that because I was like, I must have been about six or seven years old. I remember seeing Space Invaders. I remember seeing what I now know to be Circus, which was a game with a seesaw and two guys. Like, it was like Breakout, mm-hmm. but with oh, little stick okay. men who were bouncing up and down. What would you say was the first game that completely captivated you? Was it Space Invaders? Well, Space Invaders was like a huge cultural thing. Yeah. I remember that. Asteroids was one I really took to because it was simple enough that I could sort of play it a mm. bit, but it was also complicated in that you had thrust, you know, you would yeah. like thrusting oh, yeah, yeah, your yeah, ship yeah, yeah. around yeah. you to work out the sort of momentum Throwing and that kind around. of thing. Yeah. I remember thinking that seems to me much cooler than Space Invaders, <laughs> which seemed to be trying slightly too hard. Yeah. There was an aesthetic to Asteroids that I liked. It was bleak. Yeah. The unforgiving bleakness of it. it. It had a lack of character. It was like a blank-faced sort of wall of fist. <laughs> like, it was... You were Why did a, that appeal to wall you? Of fist. Because it... I don't know. <laughs> I think I liked the loneliness of it. I you like were the... a tiny little pointy thing that was very fragile. Yeah. It's easy to forget as well that games, when they first came along, they were for adults. They were in pubs. Oh, they were in true. places like Chip... They, they weren't associated necessarily with children. When they yeah. came into the home, it was a thing that you gave to kids. But my yeah. memory before that was that they smelt of cigarette no, smoke. Th- <laughs> yeah. I suppose they used to be like pinball machines, because pinball machines have never been for kids, have they? No. Because yeah. they're too physically big, really, for kids to That's use. True. That's true. <laughs> Charlie Brooker talking to Aoife Wilson and Julia Hardy about his love for video games. You can hear more about how gaming changed people's lives by subscribing to the new podcast, This Game Changed My Life. You can find it on BBC Sounds or any of your favourite podcast apps. Well, that's it for this week's programme. We'll be here same time next week with more stories of artists changing the world and the way we see it. Until then, goodbye. Boris Johnson has said there's no question that the NHS saved his life after he became seriously ill with COVID-19. The Prime Minister left hospital this afternoon and is recuperating at his country residence, Chequers. Dr Alison Pittard is the Dean of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine in Britain. She said a full recovery would take some time. Although um, a patient is well enough to go home, there is often a requirement for ongoing support. Uh, And in fact, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine is currently looking at producing guidance to make sure that the people like the Prime Minister get the support that they need so they can get back to the previous quality of life that they had. The United States has now overtaken Italy as the country with the highest number of COVID-19 related deaths in the world. It's more than 21,000. The daily figure in New York State alone increased by 758. The state's governor, Andrew Cuomo, described the figures as horrific, but pointed to some hopeful signs. Let's start with the good news, because we deserve some good news, Lord knows. Change in total number of hospitalizations is down again. This is the number that we have been watching, because the great fear for, for us was always overwhelming the hospital system, the capacity of the hospital system. The partner of the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, has revealed that she's had two children with him, conceived when he was claiming asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Assange fled there in 2012 to avoid extradition to Sweden because of sex assault allegations, which were later dropped. He's currently in jail, waiting to find out if he'll be extradited to the US. His partner, Stella Morris, has appealed for his release. Geoffrey Robertson is a barrister who's defended Julian Assange. Happy news, I think, on an otherwise doleful Easter day. It shows that that love will find a way, even when you're in self-isolation, enforced by the British police and by the CIA. They managed to produce two children. The Chelsea football legend Peter the Cat Bonetti has died. The goalkeeper made more than 700 appearances for the London club and was capped seven times by England. He was in the 1966 World Cup winning squad, but never played. He was 78. And one of the world's greatest motor racing drivers, Sir Sterling Moss, has died aged 90. He was a runner-up in the Formula One World Championship four times in the 1950s. His wife, Lady Moss, said it was one lap too many. He just closed his eyes. BBC News. 
The impact of the coronavirus crisis is felt mentally as well as physically. So in Inside Health, the virus, we talked to a blogger with bipolar disorder about how she's coping when she can't go and see the friends and family she usually relies on. And video conferencing is just not the same. She also gives us tips on how to help a friend in these difficult times. And what can we learn about living in isolation from a doctor who spent 14 months at an Antarctic research station, nine of them in complete darkness? Join me, Claudia Hammond, for Inside Health, the virus, on Tuesday evening at nine o'clock. Now on Radio 4, here's Paul Lewis. Hello, welcome to our Easter weekend money box. One subject today... How do we cope with the shock to our finances and to our confidence about the future caused by coronavirus? Millions of people are getting help from the government to replace some of their pay or their self-employment income. But as we've revealed on Moneybox over the last couple of weeks, millions more are falling through the gaps and being told to claim benefits instead. And even those who do get help will find their income considerably lower than it would have been. Everyone, of course, too, is using more heating and, of course, more hot water as they live at home for extended periods. So in this money box, we look at how to manage on a lower income, how to boost it and how to deal with those anxieties that an uncertain financial future inevitably brings. Let's hear first from Katie Riddle. Kate is a pianist and a music teacher. She works in schools where she is employed, but she makes some of her income as a self-employed home music teacher. Last year, she took maternity leave. That meant that far more than half her income came from her job, not her self-employment. And that means she can't claim under the self-employment scheme. Now, her employer could furlough her under the job retention scheme, but they've said no, as they're entitled to do. So she falls through two gaps in the system and her troubles don't end there. My partner also, he's recently become self-employed this last July and he too will receive nothing because of that. So we are, we are struggling really, we've got four children and uh, we've got nothing coming in at all. The only option available to us is universal credit and we're trying to get through since the 17th of March and finally I was successful getting through this morning after holding for three hours. They offered me an interview on the 23rd of May, so we're not even going to receive any any money until, obviously, the interview has been conducted and we've had an outcome there. Can they make you a payment between then and now, or do you have to wait to be approved? You can apply for an advance, but the gentleman that I spoke to on the phone this morning, he said he would try in the meantime to get somebody to call me within the next couple of weeks because we've got the four children. So I don't want to apply for an advance if it is that somebody is going to be offering us an earlier appointment. What are your immediate needs? What are your outgoings and your... Your incomings. Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're vast. Well, we've had to um, cancel or have a mortgage holiday for the next three months and we've had to um, put a stop to a lot of our outgoings. We're just uh, just tr- trying to keep the bills to a minimal and then just pay out on food, really. Have you got any savings that you can use? No, got absolutely no savings because last year with me taking my maternity leave, um, my income from statutory maternity pay didn't even cover the, the bills, the monthly bills. So we had to take three credit cards out last year just to continue paying the mortgage. And now we're in a situation where I can't take out another credit card. I mean, we're lucky that we can spend time with our children at home. But obviously it's very, very stressful that we don't know how we're going to afford our next food shop. School have been great because they have saved food packages at the end of the week that haven't been collected and they've delivered them to us for the last couple of weeks. So that's how we've managed to feed our family. And and what do you think the government should do? We've paid in a lot and I've never claimed a benefit in my life other than child benefit, but we're left with no option. So I think we should be supported in the same way that other workers are supported. Well, that was Katie, who really has fallen through all the cracks. Uh, Listening to that is Anna Stevenson. She's a benefits and welfare rights expert from the national charity Turn to Us. Um, Anna Stevenson, Katie's children are being fed by the unused food at her local school. The government says claim universal credit. That's there to fill the gaps. Isn't it doing that? 
Unfortunately, right now it's not. Um, Universal Credit is really, really struggling to deal with the huge increase in new claims that are being made. They had not set up processes to deal with this kind of level of demand. So ordinarily, someone who put in a claim on the 17th of March, you'd expect them to get their first payment, the 23rd of April. Katie says she's not even going to get her first interview until a month after that. Now, what she can do is get on her journal. So if she's got an online universal credit account, she can get on her journal, leave messages, keep chasing them. They are moving more staff onto processing new claims. So I do hope that she will be able to get that claim processed before the 23rd of May. Yes. And when, when does the money actually start? Not till after that interview, but is it backdated? It will be, yeah. And, and it is possible to get an advance, isn't it? It is. I can. I understand that Katie is a bit worried about taking the advance. Um, I think in her circumstances, it sounds like she really needs to take it. So an advance is um, a loan, but it's an interest-free loan made by the government, and it's paid back over 12 months from deductions from your ongoing Universal Credit Award. Listening to that is Laura Peters from the Mental Health and Money Advice Service. Um, Laura Peters, Katie and her partner not working, four small children. This is going to be very stressful, as she says. Absolutely. And I think it's really important um, now that Katie and the whole family are looking for really good ways to manage their mental health um, at this point in time. Um, particularly for people who are not working, um, sometimes um, work is actually a very, very big part of our personality. It's often the first way we introduce ourselves is by saying what we do. Um, and so being out of work can feel like we've, we've lost a big part of who we are, um, which can have a really bad effect on our mental health. I think it's really important that they take time to do things together as a family that are both enjoyable and actually will, will help support their mental health as well. We're going to hear more about stress during the programme, but let me briefly bring in Nick Hill, a money expert from the government's money and pension service. Um, Nick Hill, Katie mentioned she can't take out another credit card. Where might she go to get credit? Um, she can access free debt advice um, from uh, organisations such as Step Change and Citizens Advice Service. If she wants, she can go to the debt advice locator tool on the Money Advice Service website and it will make clear who she can speak to, whether it be online or um, over the phone um, at a time which is convenient for her. And very important to do that through the Money uh, and Pensions Advice Service website, uh, not to um, Google it because you might get all sorts of commercial companies. OK, we'll move on, but uh, stay with us, obviously, all three of you. Let's hear now from Zoe. Zoe has fallen through a different gap in the system, this one in the coronavirus job retention scheme. Now, that allows firms to furlough staff, basically tell them to go home, but still pay them 80 percent of their wages. These costs will eventually be refunded by the government. We learned this week it could cost more than 10 billion pounds each month it's open. But the scheme doesn't cover everyone. It only applies to people who were employed by the firm on the 28th of February. So people moving jobs around that period are left out. And every month last year, more than a quarter of a million people moved jobs. I left my job on the 10th of March. Um, I handed my notice in in February, worked my notice and uh, was due to start my new job on the 23rd of March. Initially, my new job was delayed for two weeks, but I've obviously delayed it again until normality is resumed and we don't know when that will be. So I'm currently without any income. I live with my um, partner and he has been furloughed. At the minute, we are really having to cut back on everything. You know, we're going to have we're having to really watch every single penny. And if it goes on for months, I don't know how it's going to going to affect our finances. You've got this job lined up at some point in the future. Is there any work you could do? Because there are some jobs around, aren't there? I mean, it's difficult because where I am, I'm, I'm in a, a small town in Cumbria. There aren't many jobs as it is. And I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the virus at the same time. I'm concerned, you know, I've got asthma and I don't want to, to have to get it. Have you got any savings that you could perhaps use? I had some savings. I was um, saving up for a, for a new car because I needed it for work. And now I've not got a job to drive drive to. Well, Zoe and her partner are going from two wages to just 80% of one. Nick Hill, that's a huge cut in the money coming in. 
a huge cut indeed and many people are facing these income shocks and it's critical when your income has such a big change you've got to get a grip of your budget look at where your ingoings and outgoings are and work out what are the essentials and non-essentials and some hard decisions will need to be made and what about savings how how financially resilient are working households um People uh, in general uh, do not have enough uh, savings set aside to cover for this uh, scenario. So it's really important that they get in touch with their creditors, ask them for some forbearance. Many organisations have been fantastic at offering assistance and trying to be flexible on payments. Yes, let's hope they're being sympathetic to Zoe. And Laura, life effectively on hold for Zoe, very hard living in this kind of limbo of not knowing what you're doing. How, How do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is obviously a really stressful situation and I would really expect Zoe to be feeling a lot of feelings of worry, anxiety and probably low mood as well. And it feels like, you know, there's kind of two approaches to the situation. One is to tackle the issue that's causing the worry and the other is to manage the emotional reaction. So Nick's already talked about doing a budget sheet. And I think that's really, really important um, when you have a change in income to get that done. But it can sometimes feel like an insurmountable task um, when that is the thing that's causing you the worry. Um, If Zoe does start to feel panic setting in, I'd really recommend some simple breathing exercises like square breathing where she breathes in for four counts, holds her breath for four counts, breathes out for four counts, then holds her breath for four counts and keeps on doing that to calm herself down and to maybe break the uh, task of doing that budget sheet down into smaller tasks. So for a first step, just gathering together details of your income for a next step looking at at the different bills that you've got um, and just to make it more manageable that way. Yes, the first step often the hardest, but many ways the most important. Well, another another person who's struggling with a reduced income is Matt Grant. He's a freelance TV camera operator. You've probably seen his work actually without knowing it. He covers sporting events, everything from horse racing to motorsport and cage fighting. But now that work has all but vanished. I, along with the majority of people in the TV and creative industries, run as a limited company. My income can go up and down. I'm much busier in the summer than I am in the winter. I pay myself a low salary through PAYE, and then I can take dividends out of the company depending on how much profit I've made. Unfortunately, dividends aren't being included in the uh, Chancellor's scheme, so I can furlough myself and I will get 80% of my very low base salary, between five and £600 a month. Now, you're going to get this low income from the job retention scheme. Can you claim universal credit on top? Because that's the government's panacea for anyone who's left out or doesn't get what they think they need from these schemes, is claim universal credit. Fortunately, I can claim some universal credit. I'm the sole income provider for my household. My eldest daughter has a medical condition and she has to go in and out of hospital for various appointments so regularly that my wife found it difficult to to get a job. There are a little bit of savings. Um, That does mean that the universal credit amount will come down. Um, It won't be nowhere near enough to cover the bills and to put food on the table, but it, it is a little bit more money. Are there any expenses you can cut back on to help you manage over what we all hope will be a temporary period? Well, as far as personal expenses are concerned I've obviously done the mortgage break I have a loan for the car I need to see if I can get that down the company still has bills to pay for as well I have the accountancy fees online software for doing my books and accounts I have uh, professional memberships how is this affecting your family it is tough there's there's no getting around it the figures do not add up I simply cannot get enough money a month now to support us. We have the pressure of my daughter's condition. She's on two immunosuppressant drugs, so um, she is at risk from this. So there's those worries involved as well. Yeah, I think pride has to go out the window and I shall be virtually knocking on the doors of family members saying, can anybody lend me some money to try and get us through this? Nick Hill, uh, obviously Matt has started to reduce some of his outgoings. One of the things he's done is a mortgage holiday. How does that work? And is that a good place to start? That's a fantastic place to start. And uh, anybody else who's struggling uh, to pay their bills and has a mortgage should get in touch with their mortgage provider to see what can be done in terms of having uh, a three-month holiday. It will mean over the net term of the mortgage, he ends up paying a little bit more. But if this gives him the breathing space, uh, it's the right thing to do right now. But he also mentioned he's got a car uh, car loan. So it's important that he gets in touch with uh, his 
uh, car finance company to see what else they can do. They might also be able to offer something like a mortgage holiday, and it may even state it in his terms and conditions if he checks them. Yes, and of course, many people have a new car. He, he doesn't. His is a, an old car on a personal loan. But people have these personal contract purchases. Um, £110 billion pounds is owed on those. Yes, it's really, really quite worrying. But some firms are offering some form of forbearance, but it's not quite as universal as uh, as what's happening with mortgages. So it's really critical that you get in touch with the creditors as soon as possible. Don't delay. Some are um, giving holidays, some are uh, extending the term, etc. And Anna Stevenson, Matt does have some savings. And many people have said to me, well, I've got some savings. I've saved up to pay my tax or to get a deposit on a house or whatever. Now I'm going to have to spend that and put that at risk. It, it's a harsh rule that if you have savings over £6,000, your benefit's reduced. Yeah, so your benefit is reduced, but it's not cut off altogether up until 16,000. So if you've got over £16,000 in savings, you won't be able to get universal credit at all. And Nick Hill, Matt is obviously finding it, it difficult to manage. He is making changes. What else can he do? Can, can he budget his way out of this? Absolutely essential that he's got a, a, a strong control of his budget. Look at all those outgoings and ingoings, list them out. It can be surprising how many hidden bills we uh, we have in the background. Check those standing orders, direct debits, see what you can cut back on now and start making, putting a little, reducing your outgoings. Um, he also mentioned potentially uh, borrowing and it's really important he sees that as a last resort because we don't want to see him start to dig himself uh, a bigger problem. So contact those creditors, see what forbearance they can offer you. But if you're not sure where to start in terms of looking at all your borrowing options, we outline them all on the Money Advice Service website. Let's hear from Alex finally. Alex McKinney. He's 29 years old and he's in a bit of a life change. He recently qualified as an electrician. After finishing his training, he decided in January that the way forward was self-employment. At first, it went really well. I was really nervous about going self-employed because, of course, you know, you're sacrificing the security of you know, guaranteed hours and guaranteed money and stuff when you do that. But no, it was, it was amazing. It was booming. I mean, you know, I've actually turned a couple of jobs away since I started. So your financial circumstances are suddenly very bad. Can you get any help from the self-employment income support scheme? No, I'm excluded because I've only been self-employed since January. And what about universal credit? They say anyone who falls through the gaps, there's always universal credit. Have you tried applying for that? I mean, I'm at the point in my life where I've got, you know, I've got student debt. I've got 10 grand of debt that I needed to, um, you know, to set up as self-employed. You know, I rent like a small one bed flat. The, the amount they'll actually give me doesn't even cover my sort of monthly fixed costs. So even if I went on to universal credit within a month, I'd, I'd start missing payments and then I'd be sort of into a nasty downward spiral. I only moved into the flat I'm in in January as well. So my mum had to sign for me as a, um, a guarantor. If I start falling into financial hardship, the legislation that was maybe meant to help me as a renter is going to be irrelevant because protection from eviction is not going to help my mum's credit score getting ruined if they start chasing her for the money that I haven't paid for the rent. And I already know for a fact that if I have to fall back on you know, universal credit, then I, I, I will miss those payments. I will miss rent. I will miss things. And it will affect my family in a way that I, I can't even stop. And that's an awful mental pressure to have to bear. Laura Peters, mental pressure is what Alex talks about. You can understand it. He feels life has been really bad to him. What can he do? So money's a really big taboo for a lot of people, actually. Um, and sometimes it's really hard for us to talk about money with our um, family. But I think it's really important that he does have an open and honest conversation with his mum as soon as possible. Um, we should try and pick a, a kind of a good time to do that. So when there's not going to be a lot of distractions around and um, he's going to have enough time to say what he needs. Um, and also to prepare for the fact that it might be bad news, but maybe even to if he has put a budget sheet together to be able to share that with her so um uh she can see where where he's coming from and, and why he's having to have that unfortunate conversation with her yes and i believe she also has some problems she has a bed and breakfast which of course is being very much affected by what's going on so in a way there's the two of them with these difficulties that somehow they have to share and and try and relieve each other i suppose of this mental mental anxiety
Absolutely. And actually, sometimes just talking about the problem, even though it's not going to make the problem go away, um, and each of them understanding that they're probably in quite similar situations can actually be very helpful rather than kind of both of them uh, wanting to bottle up those feelings and, and not tell each other what's going on is that could often make the situation worse. Yes, the first step is talking about it. The second step is probably writing something down and then doing a budget. Um, and Nick Hill, let, let's start with the loan that Alex mentioned. He borrowed £8,000, a business startup loan. Everything was going swimmingly. He still got to pay that loan back, presumably, even though his business has collapsed because of this crisis we're in. Absolutely. But it's worth getting in touch with his lender to see what uh, forbearance they can offer in terms of any other, those payments. But if his debts are getting out of control, because he's a self-employed person, he can go and use business debt line. Um, they, he can web chat with them or pick up the phone 0800 197 60 26. Alex was worried about the effect that this might have on his mother's credit rating, because if he doesn't pay his rent, she's the guarantor. Will she have a a mark against her if he doesn't pay his rent and perhaps she can't either? The uh, short answer is uh, it's quite likely yes. Um, they need to keep managing um, making those payments. But if they can agree with a creditor um, that um, has some kind of forbearance, then potentially they might, the credit score might not be affected. But if they stop making their credit commitments, then yes, your credit score will be affected. And briefly, Anna, um, Alex earlier was telling us he, he wasn't going to claim universal credit. Is that a good idea? I'd say no. Obviously, it isn't enough money, but it's more than no money. Um, if you're worried about going through the hassle of claiming it when you're not sure if you can get anything, use a benefit calculator to check if you're entitled to it before making that claim. Um, but I really would encourage people to put in the claim um, and get, get the help they're entitled to. OK, thanks. And let's hear finally a bit more from Alex, because he really does feel the whole thing is deeply unjust. I remember feeling a wave of sort of like relief and calm when the Chancellor gave the speech about how no businesses will fail, you know, as a result of the coronavirus. And I remember thinking at the time that, OK, well, this is great. I don't have to worry too much and I'll go and volunteer and I can sign up and I can do my bit and stuff. Almost even a weird kind of way, almost feeling positive, like this is my generation's version of the Blitz. This is our time to shine. This will be a defining moment for us. And then quite quickly, I realised it's not going to be that at all. It's just going to be like the financial crash all over again when, you know, people like myself who are younger and aren't as wealthy, you're just going to get left behind. Laura Peters, do you see this as affecting a whole generation of young people, sort of devastating their hopes and fear and lives and leaving them with economic problems for the rest of their lives, possibly? Yeah, I think that that's a definite worry um, in terms of at the minute, it feels very much like we're dealing with the, the current crisis and, and all the problems that that's bringing for the NHS and um, our communities. But actually, in the longer term, um, I definitely feel that there might be a rise um, in pressure on mental health services. Um, um, and, and actually that people could be going as far as experiencing PTSD. Um, what I will say is that over the past couple of years, I definitely think there's been a really good change um, in society about people being able to talk about their mental health um, and that there's now less stigma attached to that, which I think is a really positive thing. Um, and actually, hopefully people will be um, able to seek help for how they're feeling um, and we won't end up with this, you know, lost generation who... Um, because actually we are a bit more resilient now um, than we ever have been before. You were hopeful there about the generation of young people coming up and how they would be resilient to this. What words of hope can you can you say to them? This won't last forever. Um, we are going to come out of it the other side. Um, and what's really important is that we're daily practicing things that are good for our well-being um, and really bolstering ourselves and make sure that, you know, when this is over, that we're ready to get back to normal life and, and deal with, with everything that that brings as well. That's what we all hope for. My thanks to Laura Peters, Nick Hill and Anna Stevenson. Do send us your thoughts about money, stress, anxiety and coping in the time of financial shock. We do read all your emails, moneybox at pbc.co.uk and your tweets. That is just about all we have time for this Easter weekend. There is more on our podcast, which is available now. Moneybox Live is back on Wednesday answering questions about student finances in the time of coronavirus with Louise Cooper. I'm back with Moneybox next Saturday, as usual. From producer Alex Lewis, the whole Moneybox team, and from me, Paul Lewis, have a safe, isolated Easter. 
Carbon offsetting tends to be associated with planting new trees, but in Zimbabwe there's a project aimed at preserving existing forests through carbon credits, helping give, give people new jobs and access to international markets. Some light amidst the complex jungle of carbon offsetting in three minutes. But now, Paul Mayhew Archer makes the Radio 4 appeal on behalf of the Cure Parkinson's Trust. I used to produce Radio 4 comedy shows. I'm sorry I haven't a clue. Old Harry's Game, Week Ending. I also co-wrote The Vicar of Dibley. When I was 58, a friend noticed my tiny handwriting and said, I don't want to worry you, Paul, but you might have Parkinson's. What he'd have said if he had wanted to worry me, I don't know, but he was spot on. Parkinson's occurs when the brain stops sending the right messages to the rest of the body, and it means the simplest things, turning over in bed, doing up buttons, walking even, become an Olympian challenge. And imagine trying to eat when you can't cut up your food. Your swallowing mechanism doesn't work, and you can't ask for help because your speech is garbled. I've had Parkinson's for nine years, and so far I'm lucky. My fingers are fairly hopeless, but I'm at that excellent stage when I can still unwrap a bar of chocolate, but can't do the washing up. But Parkinson's is incurable and progressive, so it's going to get worse unless a cure can be found. That's where the Cure Parkinson's Trust comes in. The Cure Parkinson's Trust is dedicated to finding ways to slow down, stop and ultimately cure Parkinson's. And what they're discovering is that drugs may already exist for other conditions which could be adapted or repurposed as treatments for Parkinson's. There's even evidence to suggest a cough treatment might be an answer. Now look, I'm recording this on my phone at home because of coronavirus, and I know that's uppermost in all our minds, but Parkinson's hasn't gone away. In fact, it's on the up. Here in the UK, two people every hour old and young, are hearing the life-changing words, you have Parkinson's. The cure we so desperately need cannot be found without funding. My neurologist is a wonderful woman called Michelle Hu, and it's great having Dr Who on my side, but she doesn't have a TARDIS to take us to a future free of Parkinson's. But a donation to the Cure Parkinson's Trust could give people back the life that Parkinson's has taken from them. Can you help? You can give now. Just search online for BBC Radio 4 Appeal or call 0800 404 8144. That's 0800 404 8144. Or you can write a cheque to the Cure Parkinson's Trust and send it to Free Post, BBC Radio 4 Appeal. That's the whole address, Free Post, BBC Radio 4 Appeal. And importantly... Please mark the back of your envelope, the Cure Parkinson's Trust. Thank you. Paul Mayhew Archer. And we know it's a difficult time at the moment, perhaps, to post your donations. So do remember you can always give by phone, as Paul says. Just have your credit or debit card to hand before calling 0800 404 8144. The calls are free from landlines and mobiles. Or you can give online by going to bbc.co.uk forward slash appeal forward slash Radio 4. Gently or otherwise, Keris Matthews goes into that dark night after the news, unlocking her uncle's rare recordings of Dylan Thomas's friends and family. But first, a look at the weather. And tonight, many areas of the UK will remain generally cloudy. Wales, the Midlands, East Anglia and southern England will see some showers and some thunderstorms rumbling around, but uh, these will slowly fade through the night. In Scotland, some areas of higher ground could see some sleet or snow flurries. Now, tomorrow, many areas will see a dry and fine day. The western half of the UK will see plenty of sunshine, but in the east, it'll be cloudier. And it'll feel noticeably colder than recently, especially in southern areas where it'll also be rather windy. Looking ahead, high pressure will continue to bring dry and settled conditions across the UK. After an early touch of frost, Tuesday will bring another dry and mostly fine day with lengthy sunny spells. And it's a similar story on Wednesday, but it'll start to feel warmer again. 
That's the forecast. BBC Sounds, smart speaker and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. BBC News at 11 o'clock. This is Jason Kay. The coronavirus pandemic has reached what the Health Secretary Matt Hancock has described as a terrible marker, as more than 10,000 patients who tested positive have died in hospitals across the UK. Another 737 deaths have been reported in 24 hours. The Prime Minister has said that there's no question that the NHS saved his life after he became seriously ill with COVID-19. Boris Johnson praised the health workers who cared for him at St Thomas's Hospital in London for seven nights. He's now continuing his recovery at his country residence of Chequers in Buckinghamshire. Our political correspondent Ben Wright, who's in Downing Street, says Mr Johnson posted a tribute to the health service on Twitter. In his video message, Boris Johnson said he could see the personal courage of NHS staff and the pressures they're under. He also thanked people for following the rules on social distancing and the government is expected to extend those lockdown measures later this week. Ministers have welcomed the public's efforts to stay at home this weekend and for sticking to strict social distancing rules despite the warm weather. These people were out respecting the guidelines on the south coast in Hastings. The group of four having some drinks and then they think it's really cool to go in the playground as grown adults, so we have to explain to our kid that he can't go in the playground, but there are some idiots that think it's okay to. So we shared our views with them. It's all just empty. It's like the walking dead. I lost my uncle to COVID, 68, no underlying health conditions. So I just want to stay as safe as possible. Italy and France have recorded an improvement in their daily number of coronavirus deaths. Italy has registered its lowest tally for more than three weeks, 431. France reported slight falls in the number of the dead. Oil exporting nations have agreed to cut production by almost 10 million barrels a day following last-minute talks. The group known as OPEC Plus has been trying to find a way to shore up the price of crude, which has been battered by the pandemic. President Trump said the deal would save thousands of energy jobs in the US. Here's our business correspondent, Katie Austin. The agreement to reduce output by 9.7 million barrels per day from May is a record cut, representing a tenth of global supplies. The deal already had the backing of the US and the G20 energy ministers. A compromise was finally struck, enabling Mexico to cut production by a smaller margin than other countries, a proposal which had angered Saudi Arabia. COVID-19 has prompted a huge drop in demand as planes have been grounded and travel halted. This deal to reduce output is an effort to stabilise plunging prices. The Duke of Cambridge has become the first patron of the National Emergencies Trust. The organisation was set up last year to coordinate fundraising at a time of crisis in the UK. So far, £25 million have been pledged with the coronavirus appeal, half of which has already been distributed. BBC News at three minutes past 11. Available now on BBC Sounds. The TMS Podcast. Classic view from the boundary. I'm Jonathan Agnew and right now on BBC Sounds you can listen to Classic View from the Boundary. We'll be revisiting some classic Test Match special interviews from the last 40 years featuring rock stars, Oscar winners and sporting heroes. When you do the walk from the dressing room to the stage was just when Broad started bowling everyone out and I was screaming and I was going, let's try it! <laughs> Classic view from the boundary on BBC Sounds. Listen using the free BBC Sounds app. Stephen Nolan on BBC Radio 5 Live. Well, tonight on the show, Dr Al, an NE consultant in Manchester, who's one of those on the front line in the battle against the virus, told me about his concerns over PPE for medics. Wherever I've worked, there is sufficient PPE available. But having said that, the quality of that PPE is questionable because it's fairly cheap. The gloves we have, I I can promise you that you wouldn't even clean your sink wearing those gloves if you had bleach on it because they're so easy to tear and they're so easy to come off and they're fairly bad quality gloves. And we've been hearing from people who feel the government's financial support during the lockdown does not help their situation, including Mark and Amy. I've got a three-month holiday, so on like loans and things, I'm paying for like cars, using my savings. You frightened? Yeah, I mean, it's quite scary. I think it's also very unfair. I think with, with, there's so many people in the same situation as, as me. We've all, we've all paid tax. We should all be treated the same. Well, at the moment, I'm trying to find work, but it's not very easy. The terms of paying for things, I mean, I've probably got about another month's worth until it's going to be quite a serious situation. Like Amy was just saying, I mean, it's just terrible that we've sort of fallen through the, the cracks. 
The big stories, the big interviews and you on the phones. Here's how to get in touch. This is BBC Five Live. Call free 08085 909 693. Text 85058. Text will be charged at your standard message rate. Plus, see our privacy notice. bbc.co.uk slash five live. Stephen Nolan on BBC Radio Five Live. Now, one of the few good things the virus has caused is rock-bottom oil prices, which has made our petrol and, and diesel the cheapest it's been for years. But that might be about to change. Oil exporting nations have agreed to cut production by almost 10 million barrels a day after last-minute talks that were held online. It's a record cut equal to one-tenth of global supplies. The group known as OPEC Plus have been trying to find a way to shore up the price of crude which has been battered by the pandemic. But there's been strong disagreement, mainly between Russia and Saudi Arabia. The US President Donald Trump has welcomed the deal, saying it would save hundreds of thousands of energy jobs in the United States. Let's talk to Simon Henderson, who's, directory, who's the director of the Gulf and Energy Policy Programme at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Simon, good evening. Good evening. How significant is this deal, Simon? Uh, it's a very significant deal uh, because it offers uh, stability in the oil market, which has been in chaos for uh, the last month uh, after Russia and Saudi Arabia went uh, into an oil price war, uh, which uh, produced some of these extraordinarily low prices we've seen recently. As you mentioned in your introduction, uh the prices have been low, and this has followed through into diesel and to petrol. Uh, indeed, probably the uh, prices will now go up a bit, but frankly, uh, they will still be cheap. Why was this necessary? The, there was tremendous instability in the uh, oil market. Um, it, this is partly a long-term consequence of... Uh, uh, people moving away from oil uh, and being more environmentally conscious and so that they, they don't want to use petrol-driven cars, they prefer to use electric, uh, electric-driven cars or no cars at all. Uh, and also uh, because of the particular blow in the last month or so of the coronavirus, uh, which has led to uh, businesses shutting down and essentially the world economy, uh, if not coming to, to a grinding stop, certainly uh, uh, being wound back. It's interesting, isn't it, that... that, that, that you know, many of us don't understand the, the dynamic that dictates um, the, the, the price of oil beyond the, 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 the crude understanding that we have of economics, but it's very political. It's not just about economics. Well, the thing about oil, uh, without uh, giving you an economics lecture, the thing about oil is that it's traded internationally. Uh, and so if you can't uh, but, but if you don't have any in your own country, you have to buy it from abroad. And if you buy it from abroad, you don't have to buy it from one particular place. You can uh, buy it from another place. This means uh, that uh, it, there's an international price of oil. It's not cheaper to buy oil in Saudi Arabia than it is in uh, in parts of Africa, which produce oil. For, there are marginal differences in price uh, reflecting uh, the quality of the oil but nothing substantial. Uh, and this also means uh, that, in fact, uh, any uh, marginal change in availability uh, is instantly reflected in a, um, a, a change in price. So if there's a Middle East crisis, or at least in the past, if there's been a Middle East crisis, tension in the Middle East, war in the Middle East, the price of oil has shot up uh, and everybody benefits, or if you're an oil producer, everybody benefits from that. The Middle Eastern oil producers get more for their oil, uh, as um, uh, which reflects the political situation. But if you gain, if you're in Africa or Latin America, you can uh, you, your oil goes up in price as well. It's a it's a very it's a market which is extraordinarily. Um, 
uh, prone uh, and re reflective of the political situation. And what has happened in recent weeks is that uh, as demand has declined, uh, the, uh, the oil, major oil producers, uh, in this case particularly Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, uh, in order to maintain or, or not allow the price to sink too far, they should have cut back slightly to um, produce some stability in the market. Uh, even us as sort of consumers, you and me, uh, want a degree of stability in the market. We don't want it to be low tomorrow and extraordinarily high on Thursday. Uh, and uh, what happened a month ago was that uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia were unable to agree on the amount that they should slightly cut back. And so um, I think that we, they both had a go at punishing each other on to see who could survive low prices longest. And uh, what they were also wanting to do was to punish U.S. shale producers who've taken advantage of uh, – of uh, the the, uh, big, uh, the market in the last few years, uh, today uh, the the news is that uh, essentially that Russia and Saudi Arabia have realised what they did a month ago was uh, foolish and wrong, and they've been steered in the right direction by I'd like to say good sense, um, and uh, although it seems surprising to say it um, by Donald Trump, who appears to have been a, an adult in the room of the oil market. How influential are these world leaders in dictating what happens? Like, how, how much of a role will Trump have had to play in this deal? Well, it, it, it often seems wrong to see world affairs in personality terms, um, and it should be... Uh, it, that seems to be dramatizing the situation. But in fact, in this case, I think it is, um, it, it is appropriate. Uh, President Putin in Russia and uh, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman have been uh, at, at each other's throats, essentially, or figuratively, perhaps even literally, uh, for the last month. And... Uh, President Trump, who uh, correctly says that he's been no fan of OPEC over the years, has decided that um, he needs to knock heads together and has done so, apparently. Uh, the key question now is um, how long this uh, agreement uh, holds together, uh, because although these countries have decided to cut back or agreed to cut back, they don't in fact have to start cutting back until uh, the beginning of May. That's three weeks off and, and quite a long time in oil market terms. Uh, and the amount that they have decided to cut back, uh, plus various other bits which apparently are being chipped into the total figure, um, doesn't compensate in any way the decline in oil demand, um, which is uh, the consequence of the coronavirus. Uh, so I predict uh, further weakness in the price um, over the next few weeks, months, perhaps even years. And are there any consumers who lose out, Simon, from a fall in oil price? Well, uh, in the short term, um, if you're uh, – um, we're living in a crazy economic situation. Um, notionally, um, people who have to drive to work um, are now not uh, – with the cheap price, uh, uh, have not been having to pay so much uh, for their petrol to get to work, except they're no longer driving to work because of the coronavirus. Uh, in the slightly longer term, if only we can get through this particular stage of the coronavirus and reactivate our economies, uh, then uh, having a uh, a low oil price, or, and it doesn't have to be an absurdly cheap price, but a low oil price is good for uh, economies as they try to build up again uh, following this um, huge in the, um, health crisis. And the final question, how long 
is the the, the 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 reservoirs of oversupply that we have now. Like, how long would they last for uh, that the, the was being built up already? Well, you you put your finger on a, one of the questions, which uh, is underpins the major question of how long does this deal last for? Uh, because um, these countries, um, or many countries, but particularly Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia, have been uh, producing uh, uh, in large volumes over the last uh, few uh, weeks and have discovered uh, that they don't have uh, anywhere to sell the oil. Uh, people don't actually want it this week. And so they've had to uh, put it into storage, but the storage tanks are full. Uh, so they've had to leave it on tankers uh, afloat in the oceans, waiting for an eventual buyer. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, so there's a, a lot of oil already in the system. And merely saying you're going to cut back um, in two and a half weeks' time, three weeks' time, uh, it doesn't actually solve that particular problem. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It's, it's extraordinary how the whole industry has been turned on its head in a matter of weeks. It's, uh, we've had OPEC crises in the past, um, and an, uh, the solution to an OPEC crisis, oil crisis, is always a bit of a, a fudge uh, and the major question of has been how long is this going to last uh, before uh, its, uh, the, its inherent uh, weaknesses uh, become visible. Uh, and uh, this um, is, like the old crises, uh, it has the same weaknesses, but this time around it's for different reasons. Okay. Simon, really interesting. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It's seven, thank you, sir. It's 17 minutes now past 11. Now, stars from the world of comedy have paid tribute to Tim Brooke Taylor, who's died at the age of 79 after contracting coronavirus. He rose to fame as a star of the TV sketch show The Goodies in the 1970s and was also a long-standing panellist on BBC Radio 4's I'm Sorry, I Haven't a Clue. His Goodies co-star, Bill Oddie, described him as a true visual comic and a great friend. Rob Bryden tweeted, Wonderful man, so many happy times sat next to him, and I'm sorry I haven't a clue, my thoughts are with his family. And Stephen Fry said, A hero for as long as I can remember, and on a few golden occasions, a colleague and collaborator on Sorry I Haven't a Clue. Gentle, kind, funny, wise, warm, but piercingly witty when he chose to be. So sad, says Stephen Fry. Here are just some of Tim Brooke Taylor's many highlights. Goodies, goody, goody, yum, yum. Continue on radio, goodies, with music, music all the way, with the right up to the minute sound of a walk in the black forest. <laughs> of the goodies, well, usually most, mostly totally painful ones. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we never learnt, you see, how to do the tricks. I mean, good stuntmen or clever, I mean, learn how to fall. We do not know how to yeah. fall. And so every time you see us fall, that's hurt. <laughs> and also, it's usually five or six takes. That was close. The sooner they get rid of those silly programmes, the better they ruin the commercials. Advertising the disease of capitalist decadence. <laughs> I didn't think that was that funny. <laughs> That was close. The sooner they get rid of those silly programmes, the better. They ruin the commercials. Advertising is the disease of capitalist decadence. Nonsense is the prize, prize I've gone again. <laughs> do, 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 the funky gibbon. The funky gibbon. We are here to show you how. The health and safety would prevent the goodies being made. Again. It wasn't much fun, though, riding the tram. It was, was a it? horrible machine. As the ground pointed out, it was painted red to cover the blood, you know, so you didn't make it. You'd be absolutely loathed. Because you had to fall off it a lot. You had to fall off it a lot. The very first episode, we arrived, and we found we couldn't write it, so we rewrote the script, so we fell off it. Big laugh, very, very great pain. It's your turn. Your turn, Jim. Will you join Kate Bush singing Mothering Heights? <laughs> Not working 
this man yeah. again. <laughs> Certainly not. I'm going home. You know, if you put that on the gravestone, he was a goodie. R.I.P. I'd be very proud. Tim Burke Taylor, who's died at the age of 79. Now, scientists all over the world are racing to find a vaccine. It's a process which could take around 18 months, and there are at least 20 in development right now. But what's it like being one of the first human guinea pigs in a vaccine trial? Seattle has been one of the worst affected places in America. There have been around 9,000 cases with more than 400 deaths. Ian Hayden lives in the city and volunteered to be injected with a prototype vaccine a few days ago. I asked him why. Yeah, so the answer is pretty simple. It's that this clinical trial happens to be happening here in Seattle where I live. Um, A colleague of mine shared a link of how to sign up. You know, I'm fortunate to be in good health and in order for any vaccine to work, we're going to need healthy volunteers to step up. So uh, I, I was happy to do that. And I was not alone. There were thousands of other people who applied to be in this trial as well. And how does it work? Yeah, so I am one of 45 people participating in a phase one clinical trial, which is the earliest step of getting a vaccine approved. Um, And in a phase one trial, all the researchers are looking at is safety. They want to know whether or not this candidate vaccine is safe and well tolerated in people. So what that means is I'm going to receive two injections of the vaccine um, a month apart, and I'm going to be monitored uh, by clinicians for several months They'll be drawing my blood, keeping an eye on my health. They want to see that I that I remain healthy, and they're going to be looking to see whether or not I start producing helpful antibodies. But isn't that the point, Ian? What what if you don't? Are, are, are they not testing out on you, and are you not worried about that? Uh, by testing out on me. So at no point in this trial will I be exposed to the coronavirus. That's not how uh, this trial is going to work. Um, this being phase one, safety is the only goal. Uh, if, if it's found to be safe, this candidate vaccine, it's going to move on to a phase two trial. That's going to involve a lot more people, hundreds, maybe thousands. And there, the researchers will be looking to quantify the efficacy of the vaccine. They'll be looking to see at the population level whether the group that got the vaccine gets less infected than the group who did not receive the vaccine. So I don't quite understand. What are they testing in you then? Sorry if I'm being stupid about this. No, you're right. So this is just safety. They're, they're looking to see whether or not this vaccine is well tolerated in the subjects who receive it so that it doesn't cause any sickness of its own. But surely they don't know. OK, I see. So this isn't testing how effective the vaccine is. It's just testing what reaction your body will have to it. That's exactly right. Yeah, this is a brand new vaccine against a brand new virus. And actually, this vaccine candidate uses a relatively new technology. This technology has not led to any licensed vaccines yet. It's, it's just a couple of years old. And so part of the study is looking to see that the vaccine is not going to cause any harm. And tell us about the technology. What's your understanding of it? Yeah, so uh, all vaccines uh, work basically the same way. They're, they attempt to train the immune system to look out for an invader before it gets into the body. Normally, that works by taking a, a weakened pathogen, let's say a weakened virus, or just part of the virus, maybe just one protein from the virus, and injecting that into healthy people so that their immune systems can mount a defense so that when they are, when they do come across the real virus, hopefully they don't get infected. So this vaccine technology is a little bit different than that. Here, rather than receiving a weakened version of the virus or even a protein from the virus, what I've been injected with is a tiny piece of genetic code that derives from the virus. So it's a molecule of what's called messenger RNA. And you've already had it, right? Yeah, I received my first injection on Wednesday. There's no placebo, so that means you, you, you got an injection of something. How did you feel after it? You know, the, the, the jab itself was, was totally fine. If I had had my eyes closed, I wouldn't have known that it happened. Uh, day of, I felt completely normal. The following day, I, I developed a sore uh, shoulder, a sore shoulder right where I got the shot, which is, you know, can happen with, with vaccines from time to time. That went away in about 24 hours, and now I feel absolutely normal, nothing to report. And are you doing this for the money? Do you get paid well for this or what? Uh, certainly not for the money. No, they, they give uh, all the volunteers $100 per clinical visit. 
So 1100 total, not all that much for a 14-month commitment, um, but it, it's certainly not for the money, no. And have you had coronavirus yourself? I don't believe that I have, um, and I've been fortunate in that uh, nobody close to me, none of my loved ones have been infected or known positive. What's life like in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, so unfortunately, Seattle was one of the earliest American cities to get hard hit by this virus. And we've been on lockdown for quite some time. I've been working from home for several weeks. I only leave the house to get groceries and, and occasionally to go on a run. Um, and, you know, I've never seen the city like this. It's, you know, restaurants are still open for delivery. You, there, there are food on the sh there's food stocked on the shelves. But otherwise, it's pretty much shut down. This weekend, we're closing large parks. Um, you know, it's very strange to be living in a city that is on such strict lockdown. And, of course, a completely different change of life for you as, as, as well as the rest of us. What did you do for a living? That's right. So uh, for my day job, I work at the University of Washington at a, re at a research institute that actually, among other things, does vaccine development, uh, okay. including for coronavirus. That, that work is completely unrelated to the trial that I'm involved in, though. And uh, are you impressed with how President Trump was handling things? Uh, I, w I wouldn't use the word impressed, no. I, I have been impressed by my state governor here, Governor Inslee in the state of Washington, I think has started you know, moving on this thing rather early. Um, I've been impressed by that and by our city mayor as well. And in terms of the coronavirus research, you said that your company does. That's separate to what you're getting done. So what were they looking at? So that's another company. That's at the University of Washington, a public university here. Um, and we're also, like, like many scientists around the world, you know, we recognize that coronavirus is a serious threat. And so we're doing what we can to try to create new candidate vaccines to treat it. And we work on a, a different vaccine technology. It's not there's, nearly as far along as the trial that I'm in. There's been quite a lot of, of chatter here um, because of a newspaper article, actually, that a vaccine could be discovered by September. But, you know, as we looked more at that story, that would take everything to fall into place perfectly, um, which it's unlikely to do. So we're more than likely going to be waiting 18 months for a vaccine in. That's about right. Yeah. You know, this phase one study that I'm involved in, which, again, is the earliest step of the vaccine approval process. And this is the first phase one study to begin. This phase one study is scheduled to last 14 months. Now, we could know whether or not this vaccine is safe and ready for phase two testing in less time than that. We could know in as little as three months, according to Dr. Fauci here in the U.S. Um, but, you know, it just is a hard truth that vaccine development takes time. It's not the kind of thing you can rush. Um, for, for lots of different reasons. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the, 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 the prospect of having, you know, this type of lockdown for many more months, we just don't know when we're going to be able to get back to our normal lives again. That's right, yeah. And, you know, a vaccine in the long term is certainly going to help with that. Um, and it is a long-term goal for, for dealing with this pandemic. Um, but we, you know, this is a new virus. We don't know how it's going to change. We don't know how it's going to circle the, the globe to what extent it's seasonal. You know, we saw with the 1918 flu, it was seasonal and it came in waves. So it's unlikely that the next several months will look exactly like the month that just happened. You know, this, this is a dynamic situation. And how is it where you are? Are people observing the lockdown? I would say so, yeah. I'm starting to see, uh, you know, masks on the faces of just about everybody out in public when they do go out. And that's a, a brand new sight for me to see. Um, but from what I can tell, people are complying. Um, the only exception to that may be the parks. We've had a couple weeks of absolutely gorgeous weather here in Seattle, which is rare. Um, and Seattleites are, are ready to go enjoy the sun. And so they've been flocking to the parks and, and crowding them, unfortunately. So those parks are starting to get shut down. I think the city government is, is taking that a bit more seriously now that the weather's getting good. Yeah, and that, that's going to be the test, isn't it, over the next few months as the weather gets really, really nice. Certainly here in the UK, are people going to behave? That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope so. OK, well, Ian, listen, the best of luck and, and let's hope that whatever your vaccine is, let's hope that that's one of the ones that works. Sir, thank you. Let's hope so, too. Yeah, my thank pleasure. You. Night night. That's Ian Hayden, uh, who's volunteered to be injected with a prototype vaccine. We'll get the news now at half past 11. On digital, BBC Sounds, smart speaker and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live.
The BBC News on Five Live. I'm Shabnam Yunus Jewell. The Health Secretary Matt Hancock says it's a sombre day as the number of coronavirus related deaths in the UK has risen to more than 10,000. The UK is the fifth country to surpass that figure, joining the US, Spain, Italy, and France. Boris Johnson has returned to his country residence, Chequers, in Buckinghamshire after a week in hospital with the virus. The Prime Minister says the NHS saved his life. The government has confirmed plans for an app that will warn smartphone users if they've recently been in close proximity to someone thought to have the illness. The Equality and Human Rights Commission says it will offer advice to the NHS to ensure the new technology protects people's privacy. And oil producers have agreed to slash global output by about 10% after a slump in demand caused by the lockdowns. The deal is the largest cut in oil production ever to have been agreed. To sport now, and three-time Formula One world champion Sir Jackie Stewart says the sport has lost the best example of a racing driver there's ever been following the death of Sir Sterling Moss. He was 90 and had been suffering from a long illness. Moss famously lost out on the Formula One title in 1958 to compatriot Mike Hawthorne. After vouching for his rival and preventing him from being disqualified in a race, Moss never won the world championship. Here's the BBC's chief Formula One writer, Andrew Benson. He won four Grand Prix that year. Hawthorne won one. There was no question as to who was the best driver in that season or in any of the seasons that Moss took part in after Juan Manuel Fangio was uh, retired. That season was also defining in Moss's own view of how important the championship title was. He always said after that that he would pref- he pre- much preferred winning races, especially if he was the underdog, that that carried more meaning to him than the world championship itself. Tributes have also been paid to the former Chelsea and England goalkeeper Peter Bonetti, who's died aged 78 after a long illness. He won seven England caps and played 729 times for Chelsea. Former captain John Terry has said, I'm heartbroken, a Chelsea legend and hero. Crystal Palace boss Roy Hodgson says the Premier League season must be completed and that he doesn't want artificial means of deciding the championship, European places, as well as promotion and relegation. In a message to the club's fans, Hodgson says they accept that could mean a shorter break between seasons. And World Rugby Vice Chairman Agustin Pichot has made a last-minute bid for the most powerful job in the sport. He'll challenge current chairman Bill Beaumont to standing for re-election. Here's our rugby union correspondent Chris Jones. Well, Pichot has long cultivated a reputation as a man fighting against the rugby establishment and now he's bidding for the top job in the world game. While he's going up against Bill Beaumont, whose approach is certainly more traditional, both their manifestos are quite similar. They vow to try and solve rugby's oldest conundrum, how to spread and grow the game while maximising revenues and protecting players. The vote is next month and whoever wins is likely to preside over a sport forever changed as a result of the coronavirus crisis. And that's your latest from BBC Sport. Get up! Monday morning on BBC iPlayer. Morning. Haven't you heard? I'm moving up in the world. The world is always so inventive and fresh. Obsession never dies. She's back, Eve. I thought you'd want to know. I am not going down that road again. It's not my problem anymore. Brand new Killing Eve. I can handle this. Starts Monday from 6am, only on BBC iPlayer. First for news and the best live sport. This is BBC Five Live with Stephen Nolan. Now, the coronavirus crisis has passed an awful marker. The number of people who have died with the virus in hospitals in the UK has gone past 10,000. And we continue to remember that behind every death is a life lived. As terrible as that figure is, What we've tried to do on the Nolan programme is to look ahead, look at the tools that we can use and the methods we can employ to get past the lockdown and back to normal life. One tool being talked about this weekend is a mobile phone app. Matthew Newman is from MLEX in Brussels, specialising in cyber security, data protection and privacy. He's been telling me how the app will work. So the way it works is... Uh, you have an app on your phone, and it doesn't matter if it's an iPhone or a Google Android phone. You have um, an app that lets you know when you come into contact with other people who may have uh, been tested uh, positive, and you don't actually know that they are um, uh, carrying the virus. I think one of the, the main challenges 
uh, confronting us right now is that we don't know when people are carrying the virus. And this app will, uh, technically, it's quite interesting because it uses Bluetooth uh, technology. So Bluetooth is when your phone is pinging, sending little messages to other phones, and it's in a, in a very small radius. So it could be two meters. And within that radius, uh, the phone will pick up uh, other signals from other phones. And if, let's say, as an example, uh, you're in the supermarket and you have um, a line of people, um, someone in front of you um, has, the, has a phone with this app downloaded, and you, your phones exchange information. These are identifiers that are sent uh, automatically. And then later on, that person uh, comes down with symptoms for COVID-19. Uh, you didn't know it at the time when you were right next to the person. And uh, that person uploads their symptoms uh, to a central database. And then um, you're sitting in your flat, you're si self-isolating, and you get a message from uh, the NHS saying um, you've been in contact with someone uh, on this date and our advice to you is to uh, go and get tested and, and also to check if you have symptoms uh, or some other uh, health advice um, depending on, on what your condition is. And this is the way, uh, this is very crucial for the government right now and for all governments that are considering using this kind of app. This is the way to get out of the confinement, to get out of the lockdown, because at some point we will be circulating around uh, in cities, in towns, uh, amongst our neighbors, and we need to have a way of knowing uh, who may be uh, potentially uh, uh, COVID-19 positive. So it's, it's, it's one tool, along with uh, extensive testing, to get us out of uh, the confinement orders. And there, there's an obvious downside here, and it's our privacy. And I get it that these are exceptional times, but this is Big Brother in, in, by its very definition. This is the government tracing us every step of the way and everybody that comes into contact with us. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you, you, you really put your finger on one of the main uh, problems and challenges for any government that decides to go for this kind of technology. So I, I read what uh, the head of MI5 said this morning, Lord Evans, uh, about this technology and, and the worry of uh, mass surveillance. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, the yeah. data protection authorities in, uh, across the world and, and, and in the EU, um, they want to make sure that any use of this technology puts privacy first. Lord and Evans called it a severe intrusion into personal privacy. Yes, yes. And, and you know, I, I think what, one of the things, the big challenges for uh, Matt Hancock and, and the NHS, their credibility is on the line. If they put this technology out there and people discover that it is a way of uh, tracking people when they don't know, then uh, no one will use it. And if no one uses it, its purpose is completely destroyed. So they have every interest to get this right. And that's why Matt Hancock, in his, in his statement that you just played, um, he said that the source code is going to be open and available and transparent. And that's key because uh, the techie people out open there... Open and available oh, and transparent to hackers, surely? Well, see, that's where you have to have a little bit of faith in the the technology behind it. So um, the, the the two companies involved, Google and Apple, they put out three documents on Friday... These documents, uh, and I've gone through them, they go into sort of minutiae, minute detail about how the actual app would work. And at the same time, um, here in Europe, the European Data Protection Supervisor went through those documents and said, yep, they're ticking off the right boxes to make sure that privacy and fundamental rights are respected. And I can assure you that those, those people, they do know what they're talking about. Uh, so we have to have a bit of faith uh, in the in the in the watchdogs, the people who are actually watching data privacy, to say, okay, look, we've had a, a hard look at this, and and we think that they're doing the right thing for protection data privacy. 
It's really interesting, Matthew, and thank you very much indeed for talking us through some of this. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure too, Stephen. Thank you. Good evening. Now, the app on its own, of course, is not the solution. What else needs to be considered? I'm, I'm fascinated by looking out the other side of this. And for those of us who, who are OK, and, and, and please God, for those of us who do survive this, and the vast majority of us will, how do you get out of this lockdown? Dr Simon Clark might be able to help us with this, an Associate Professor in Cellular Microbiology at the University of Reading. Hello, Simon. Good evening. So, what's your favourite route out of the lockdown? Well, after we've gone through the plateau phase, <clears throat> which I think we're probably about to start, or we should be starting if the, the modelling is right, if people continue to observe social distancing, proper hygiene procedures, etc., we should be through that in about 10 days-ish, maybe a couple of weeks. And then we will start to see a decline in the number of new infections, and therefore, well, we were already seen in decline in the number of new infections and we will subsequently see a decline in the number of people who are admitted to hospital and those who die. If we get a steep enough decline, that means sooner rather than later, the government can start to lift restrictions. And I imagine it will do that in a piecemeal fashion and it will lift them, first of all, on people who are at less risk if they get the disease. And let's face it, that's going to be younger people. But the reason why, sorry if I'm being stupid about this, Simon, but surely the reason why the plateau is happening is because we are staying inside. You, so so to go back out right. again means there's the possibility that the whole thing kicks off again, surely. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that is why it mustn't be done too soon. And even if it isn't done too soon and is given plenty of time, there's every opportunity that it will come back anyway because that's what's happening or seems to be happening in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and possibly China, although the data from China is unreliable. So um, even though we will hopefully um, reduce the number of new infections, we will at some point this year, later this year, probably in the summer, start to see it go back up again. I'm afraid it's inevitable. This is with us until we manage to stamp it out with a vaccine, assuming we ever get a usable one. What do you mean, assuming if? Surely it's only a matter of time, is it not? Um, it's never just a matter of time with vaccine development. I'll remind you that we've been trying to develop a vaccine for HIV for nearly 40 years without any success. And there are other vaccines, other diseases, sorry, we would like a vaccine for, which we don't have one. It is not simply a matter of time that we will get a vaccine. I think on balance, the probability is that we will get one. Um, and certainly Why? In the next so what's the difference years, about this? Why do you think it's probable we will with this and, and, and we haven't, as you've pointed out, for other diseases? Why? Because there is a, a significant research um, effort going into this, more so than with other, other, other diseases. And it, the, the virus is not as variable as, as some of those other viruses. So it's uh, much easier to pin down. You said that another spike could come in the summer. Does hot weather not... Uh, plateau this on itself? Well, I, I'll itself. remind you that, that it's been very successful in Singapore and it's never cold in Singapore. It's always hot okay. there. Um, there is this theory going around that, that warm weather, the summer, will, will reduce the toll. Um, that might be the case, but it might not. We've only known about this for just over three months and we'd need to know about it for at least a year before we can start commenting on things like that. There is a coronavirus that is endemic in the human population as well that causes the summer cold. Also, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that was that is caused by a coronavirus and that the toll of that was worse in the Middle East in the summer. I'm really interested, uh, Simon, in, in your analysis of what's happened with those countries who have early on locked people down um, and, and, and have a, an advantage from that in, in terms of uh, their mortality rates. What is happening now that they've released those? Um, well, you see in the Far East, in places like uh, Korea, South Korea, which um, I think part of its success wasn't just locking things down. It was, in fact, uh, its contact tracing and its testing. Um, that we're starting to see case numbers go back up again. You know, unless you actually literally, literally remove all of the virus from your population, it will start to spread at some point. So... 
it's quite pessimistic outlook then, Simon, is it? It is. But if we get a, vi- a vaccine, then we can generate enough herd immunity in the population in order to keep it under control. That's herd immunity then? That's herd immunity, but gained by a vaccine, not gained by letting the, pop- the, the, the infection, the virus, rip through the population and kill lots of people. It can, herd immunity can happen either way. But it's no gar- there is no guarantee, even if you let it rip through the population, that it will generate herd immunity. There is no, we don't know how long the post-disease immunity that you might get from this will last. If you get this, you build up immunity. My goodness, that would be a game changer, a profound game changer if we didn't, would it not? It would, yes. I mean, you have to remember that when you get the infection and you get over it, it's because your immune system has cleared it away. So there will be some, probably some immunity hanging around, but it's questionable how long that lasts for. Like I keep saying, we've only known about this for three months. So we can only we could only say with any certainty that people have that immunity memory for three months because we we have no longer frame of reference and as i said earlier and i've read sorry simon to interrupt but i've read some reports that some people have had it twice is that accurate exactly exactly and there are more reports of that coming through um that don't seem to be getting much traction in the press in this country so can you tell me a little bit more about those cases do we know much about them no, other than that it's people getting um, a positive detection of the virus again and getting the symptoms again. So it's not even like people are getting maybe the virus but not the symptoms the second time around. Um, there is, you know, there is evidence of disease. And how, how would that, how common is that? Because, look, we get the flu every year, don't we, if we don't get the jab? And, and so it's quite common for things to come around um, yeah, time and time the, again with an individual. The, the flu, flu viruses are much more changeable than, than this one. Um, and you get to see um, every sea, flu season, every winter, what's coming our direction in the Northern Hemisphere, because nearly always they get it first in the Southern Hemisphere. So that gives us time to produce vaccine. But... Um, you know, this this is probably not a reinfection with a, a, a sort of a different version of the same virus. So that, if you, I'm trying to think through the implications of if you could get this again relatively soon, that that has a massive impact. First of all, on the NHS that could be dealing yes. with people on multiple occasions. It would suggest that until we get a vaccine, Simon, to correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, I'm thinking off the top of my head, that we've got to keep these social distancing measures until we get a vaccine. Yes, it does. And I think we probably do have to keep them until we get a vaccine. It also makes developing a vaccine much more difficult because you've got to generate in a vaccine an immunity which hangs around in the body for years um, you could boost that periodically. We're all con- uh, we're all familiar with the concept of uh, boosters for vaccines. That that's not unusual. Um, but um, yeah, it, it makes things much more difficult in terms of getting a vaccine if that is indeed what is happening. We 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 constantly hear Simon about the possibility for this virus to mutate. When a virus mutates, does that make the vaccine which has been created defunct? Not necessarily. It depends what the vaccine reacts to. Um, There are lots of different uh, candidate vaccines uh, that are being researched. And it's, you know, there's just no way of knowing which one or ones will work. And if several of them work, which will be the best one. So um, what happens with flu, for instance, is that you get antibodies to two molecules on on its surface, uh, one called haemagglutinin, one called neuraminidase, and uh, they change um, over the course of the year. They pick up mutations, they change. So if the, 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 any vaccine is to um, sort of single or, or only a couple of different molecules on the surface of the virus, then there's every chance that they will mutate and change. If it's a bit more general, a bit more global um, in terms of what a vaccine targets, then that is much less likely. But I will also point out that this virus doesn't mutate as quickly as flu. 
the common it cold. Mutate. The common cold is a coronavirus, isn't it? Uh, there are lots of different things that cause the common cold, and it can be caused by coronavirus. So not every time you get a common cold, <coughs> get the cold, sorry, um, is it caused by a coronavirus. But you and I will have almost certainly have had all four of the um, the uh, coronaviruses that cause the common cold and probably had them multiple times. I've read also reports, Simon, about those people who have survived this, that their plasma... Uh, may be valuable. Yeah. Is it? And what is plasma and how would it be valuable? So plasma is basically your blood without cells. Um, <clears throat> so what the plasma has in it is the antibodies. So your antibodies, when you get an infection, you will mount an antibody response and they're putting that into people and, you know, they're, they're sort of transfusing them with uh, people's plasma. Um, and these are people who've recovered from the infection and uh, they're seeing a, a better recovery from the disease in really sick people so the question is 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 it because those really sick people don't have a very good antibody response and you're giving them somebody else's or is it that those antibodies would uh, would rescue anybody uh, did, did, did the person they got them from have a particularly good response and just because you generate antibodies doesn't mean that those antibodies will be there in six months' time or a year. But but the but the, the plasma in those people who have successfully fought this off. Yeah. To to put that, what is is that their blood? Is that what plasma is, or what is it? Yeah, it is. It's like a blood transfusion. It's no so different. when you're when you're putting someone else's blood into a, 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 another person's body, yeah. what's the what's the downside of trying that if the blood is safe? Uh, if the blood is safe, then there are very few um, uh, um, downsides <clears throat> if the blood is safe. You have to test do all, all the proper tests on it. But I'm, I'm not a, uh, a specialist or, or not very knowledgeable about transfusion medicine, I'm afraid. So OK. It's rapid-fire questions for me, Simon, in no particular sure, no order. When, when we talk about um, a virus mutating, how does a virus mutate? Like, how, how literally does... It, does something that that has a a state change into a different state? Okay, so um, mutation is a normal biological process. It's why human beings all look different, essentially. Um, so it's it's nothing. You know, the process of mutation is nothing in and of itself to be worried about. What happens when you're when a, a piece of DNA, or in the case of this virus, a piece of RNA, because it's it's uh, its genes are written in a slightly different language to ours. Um, when it replicates, mistakes are made, and that's how you get a mutation if that mistake isn't caught and rectified. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how things okay. mutate. And, and, and how does a, a, a virus replicate? It replicates by injecting itself into a host cell. In the case of this coronavirus, it'll be a cell in the lining of our airways and hijacking the normal... Uh, molecular biology of the cell to, to make many copies of itself, that sort of disrupts the physiology of the cell and it will eventually release virus. And that's the problem. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, I'm sorry if I'm getting too technical or whatever, but I'm, I guess I'm wondering, like, how does it replicate? Like, what's the process of replication? Is it is it feeding off chemicals in our body? Or no, how? it has it has no, um, it has no physiology. It injects itself, it, it, it enters the cells in your body. Different viruses will infect different cells. And it, it hijacks the machinery inside those cells, which is, is involved in sort of the everyday physiology of those cells and in making new copies of those cells. What's your gut instinct? When do you think life will be back to normal? My gut instinct, probably towards the end of 2021. Do you think we will be anywhere close to being able to live our lives freely by the end of this year? Um, I think we will still be in some form of... Um, some form of uh, uh, control, some form of variation on our normal lives uh, this time next year. We may have even seen... <coughs> pardon me. 
We may have even seen another lockdown between now and then. And final, final question. Why does this only happen once, not, not very often? Like why, why do things like this not happen frequently? Well, new viruses do pop up all the time, and the, 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 in doing so, it's, a, it's an entirely random process. So it just so happens that this time, one has popped up which can jump from an animal to a human and can pass from human to human. And in doing so, <clears throat> is pretty pathogenic. It's pretty good at causing disease. Uh, and it really is just chance. But this was going to happen sooner or later. I remember as an undergraduate, well over 20 years now, 20 years ago now, being told um, that, that a pandemic would happen at some point. And of course, everybody assumed that it would be influenza because, as I explained to you, flu is a much more mut- mutable virus. It's much more prone to mutations than a coronavirus is. It begs but we've known about why, coronaviruses. Yeah, it begs the question why were countries around the world not better prepared? Like if you're if you're hearing it in your studies twenty years ago, and you know, it, it, why was the world not better prepared? Well, it's a good question. These are political decisions as to what, uh, how much resource is is diverted and, and dedicated to um, guarding against these sorts of things. Um, you know, it, it's a decision that has to be made <coughs> against competing priorities. You know, do you spend it on um, a potential pandemic that might be along in five years' time, or do you spend it on cancer or mental health now? You know, th- these are the decisions that uh, that need to be made, need to be taken. I know there are some people, aren't there, who are saying that with these vaccines, which are are, are still being developed and still being tested, that what they think should happen is that even before they're impro- approved, even before uh, the safety checks are done on them, we should be spending billions of pounds building factories, getting them into production, because the billions that will be wasted for those vaccines that, that we will end up discovering don't work is minuscule compared to the trillions that this is costing the economy. Well, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, that you know, there are so many different ways in which potentially one could generate a vaccine that you would need many, many different types of factory. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these won't work or, and some of them will work but won't be safe. Uh, hopefully one or two of them will work and will, uh, will be safe and uh, it'll be a vaccine that's easy to produce and will be cheap to produce. Um, but we don't know yet. Well, I hope you find that interesting. I certainly did. Listen, we have two minutes left before the end of the programme tonight. Carla's in Tedbury. Hello, Carla. Hello, Stephen. It's um, really very, very quick, uh, quickly. Um, Fascinating programme this evening, by the way. Um, Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that there there have been an, a succession of um, sort of um, mis well it, I won't say misinformation but the, the dithering and um, changing their mind and not following other countries you know with their with, with the way they've been locking down their countries very very quickly and that's my point um, is that really I do think this government has been terribly slow and still I mean after listening to that nurse this evening. That was heart wrenching, and how and how could anybody? This is a nurse think, who didn't think that she had enough PPE. She was a domiciliary care worker, actually. Uh, sorry, do- care worker. Yes, um, I mean that she wasn't making that up. She, you know that this poor woman. I I just could. I I honestly want. I almost wanted to weep. You know, Simon. I, well, I was weeping inside. You know. This is not on. And for, for Matt Hancock to say, oh, yes, yes, yes it, I, I get the impression it's all dither, dither, dither and, and not enough action. That's really what I wanted to say. Good evening. The total number of coronavirus deaths in UK hospitals has risen above 10,000. One of the government's scientific advisers has warned that Britain could become the worst affected country in Europe. The Prime Minister, who's left hospital, has paid an emotional tribute to the NHS for saving his life. The deaths have been announced of the comedian Tim Brooke Taylor and one of the greatest ever Grand Prix drivers, Sir Sterling Moss. The COVID-19 pandemic has reached what the Health Secretary this evening called a terrible marker. More than 10,000 patients who'd tested positive have died in hospitals across the UK. Latest figures to be published show another 737 deaths reported in 24 hours. 
Earlier today, a leading scientist advising the government warned that the UK was likely to become one of the worst affected countries in Europe, if not the worst. Here's our political correspondent, Tom Barton. As the total number of confirmed deaths among coronavirus patients in UK hospitals reached 10,612, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock said today was a sombre day. The speed at which COVID-19 is taking lives has led one of Britain's leading experts in infectious diseases to warn that the UK could be among the country's worst affected. The director of the Wellcome Trust, Sir Jeremy Farrer, who advises the government and the World Health Organization, told the Andrew Marr show that the number of people being infected wasn't yet at a peak. The numbers in the UK have continued to go up. I do hope that we're coming close to the number of new infections reducing and in a week or two the number of people needing hospital reducing and tragically in a couple of weeks' time the number of deaths plateauing and then starting to come down. But yes, the UK is likely to be certainly one of the worst, if not the worst, affected country in Europe. Sir Jeremy also warned it was probably inevitable that there would be a second and even third wave of the disease. This afternoon's news conference, Mr Hancock said Sir Jeremy's intervention reinforced the importance of following the government's guidance to stay at home and observe social distancing. We get advice from all sorts of experts and we take it all very seriously uh, and we assess it um, throughout. Now, the, uh, the future of this virus is unknowable as yet because it depends on the behaviour of millions of people and the great British public. Another 5,288 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in the UK, bringing the total number to more than 84,000. Mr Hancock said Britain had started to see a flattening of the curve because people were following government guidance. It showed, he said, the importance of the national effort to cope with what he called an invisible killer. Our science editor, David Shookman, has been examining the warning that Britain could be the hardest country hardest hit in Europe. The comment from Sir Jeremy Farrer that the UK may end up with the worst death toll in Europe was not categoric. It's his judgment that that scenario was possible, based on different forecasts of the pandemic. These computer models come up with a wide range of outcomes because they rely on assumptions about how the disease will spread. And comparisons with other countries are anyway difficult because governments reacted in different ways at different times and their systems for counting deaths vary. In France, for example, the daily figures include people who died in care homes. Here in the UK, they're only for deaths in hospitals. In Italy, early in the outbreak, some people were recorded as having died of pneumonia when COVID-19 might well have been to blame. In any event, the message from scientists tracking the pandemic is that it's still early days and that even in countries like Germany, praised for their handling of the outbreak, everything now depends on the response of the public. Italy has reported a further 431 coronavirus deaths, its lowest number in more than three weeks. Nearly 19,900 people with the virus have died there during the outbreak, making it the second worst hit country behind the United States. Boris Johnson has paid tribute to the NHS, saying there's no question it saved his life after he became seriously ill with COVID-19. The Prime Minister left hospital this afternoon and is continuing his recovery in his country residence, Chequers. In a video message, Mr Johnson admitted there was a point when things could have gone either way. Here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright. The Prime Minister's hospitalisation for coronavirus underscored the severity of the crisis facing his government and the country. But today, a week after being admitted to St Thomas's, Boris Johnson returned to Chequers. In a video message posted by Number 10, a clearly relieved and grateful Mr Johnson praised the care he'd received. He said there was no question the NHS had saved his life. Mr Johnson name-checked many of the doctors and nurses who had looked after him and singled out two in particular. They're Jenny from New Zealand, in the Cargill on the South Island to be exact, and Luis from Portugal near Porto. And the reason in the end my body did start to get enough oxygen was because for every second of the night they were watching and making the interventions I needed. Looking weary but wearing a suit and tie, Boris Johnson said he had seen the pressure the NHS was under and the courage of its staff. 
The Prime Minister spent three days in intensive care receiving oxygen, and today his pregnant girlfriend, Carrie Simons, tweeted there were very dark times last week and said her heart went out to everyone worried sick about their loved ones. Boris Johnson thanked the country for following the lockdown rules and said progress was being made in the battle against coronavirus. We will win because our NHS is the beating heart of this country. It is the best of this country. It is unconquerable. It is powered by love. So, thank you from me. Boris Johnson will now continue his convalescence and it may be weeks before the Prime Minister is fully back to work. As the loss of life in the pandemic continues to rise across the UK, our special correspondent Alan Little has been looking at the personal stories of some of the victims. They are a cross-section of modern Britain in all its diversity and distress. They remind us that none of us is beyond the reach of the worst that the virus can do. Healthcare workers have begun treating and mourning their own colleagues. Dr Edmund Adedeji worked in emergency medicine in Swindon. He was 62. His family said he died doing the job he loved, serving others before himself. Not all of the key workers we depend on are in the NHS. 36-year-old Mexnak Ayanacho drove a number four London bus and was asthmatic. His mother said transport workers need better personal protection. Ryan's story from Ayrshire had been working in Dubai. He'd come home to celebrate his 40th birthday. He died after telling his wife he did not want to go to hospital where he would be alone. Pooja Sharma was another key worker, a pharmacist at Eastbourne District Hospital. She was 33. Her father, Sudhir Sharma, an immigration officer at Heathrow Airport, died the day before her. One of Pooja's friends posted this online. Please, please, please inform family and friends to take this very seriously and to self-isolate and socially distance as much as possible. The Business Secretary, Alec Sharma, has admitted that more money needs to go out faster to businesses applying for emergency loans from the government. More than 300,000 are thought to have applied for help, but fewer than 5,000 have been successful so far. The former Governor of the Bank of England, Lord King, has said it was a mistake for banks to close so many local branches in response to the pandemic. Here's our business correspondent, Katie Austin. The business interruption loan scheme is meant to help companies facing cash flow problems survive the pandemic. It was overhauled at the start of this month in response to claims that banks were taking advantage of the crisis and complaints from small firms struggling with onerous eligibility criteria. The business secretary, Alok Sharma, said today that 4,200 loans had been granted, worth £800 million. However, it's thought only 1.4% of applications have so far been successful. Lord King told Sky News that if so few business loans were being granted, something had gone wrong. He said bank branches which had closed could still have functioned, with social distancing, to respond to the queries of businesses trying to apply. Mr Sharma conceded that money needed to go out faster, but said lenders were trying, with staff working over the Easter weekend. Christians around the world are celebrating Easter amid restrictions that have left many confined to their homes. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, recorded his traditional Easter address online from his kitchen, where he hailed the heroism of frontline workers. And, as our religion editor Martin Bashir reports, Pope Francis held the traditional Easter vigil in an almost deserted St Peter's Basilica. In Rome, Pope Francis delivered his annual message in starkly different circumstances to those normally associated with the joy of Easter Sunday. 